let's check back in with our Courtney Beasley at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Courtney. Thanks, Daryl. As we said earlier, the team here in Mission Control Houston is actively monitoring the International Space Station as they await Dragon's arrival. The crew aboard the International Space Station is currently in a sleep period and they are scheduled to wake up at midnight central time. They have completed a number of tasks to prepare the station for Crew 6, like setting up tools to monitor Dragon's arrival and prepping the sleep stations for the new residents. Many of their clothes and other belongings launched on a previous cargo resupply mission. And then back here in Mission Control Control Houston, Flight Director Judd Freeling and his team are in constant communication with the SpaceX Mission Director for Crew-6's launch to the space station. Once we get into integrated operations, the NASA Flight Director will be conducting this series of go-no-go no -go polls at the predetermined checkpoints for Dragon's approach. We'll continue to follow along from here in Mission Control Houston. And during our launch coverage, we like to highlight employees in the commercial crew program who are working behind the scenes to make today's mission possible. Earlier this week, Kennedy's Jasmine Hopkins spoke to NASA's recovery director for Crew 5. Let's take a look. Joining us now is NASA recovery director Brian Berry. Thanks for being here. Of course, thank you. Of course. So, uh, Brian, we understand that you are the NASA recovery director for Crew 5, but you've actually done a lot of things for human spaceflight. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Yeah, that's right. So, I started my career as a flight controller for the ISS program. Uh, my team was responsible for maintenance on the space station. So I had the opportunity to uh, work directly with the astronauts, train them on tools and repair procedures. Um, so that was a lot of fun and something I never thought I would do when I was studying to be an engineer. Um, after that, I moved over to um, the safety team and I was our safety rep for the uh, commercial crew program safety panel. So that was my first exposure to CCP and I would go review the hazard reports for uh, Dragon and Starliner. Um, that was a pretty neat experience also because I was able to work with Bob and Doug prior to Demo 2 and just kind of work with them on the hazard reports and get their perspective on, on the risk and the mission overall. Um, after that, in 2020, um, I came out to Commercial Crew and I work for them directly now and I've been doing launch and recovery operations since then. Um, on the launch team, uh, my role is to lead the rescue effort if we need to, if there's a, a pad uh, emergency egress or a pad abort. Uh, the launch rescue director calls in the rescue forces, so that's what I did for Crew-5 launch last year. Um, and then as the recovery director, uh, I lead the NASA portion of the team that goes out on the ship with SpaceX. Uh, we bring out our flight surgeons and we check out the crew and we load them up on the helicopter and get them back home. Right, so you've worn a lot of hats for the commercial crew program. How did your work as a flight controller in Houston prepare you to be a NASA recovery director? Well, in Houston, um, working the ISS operations, you know, you see day in and day out in the control center, you get the full feel of the six-month mission, um, so you understand what the crew is going through for that long of a mission. And uh, I think I just kind of bring that crew perspective of the ISS side to the CCP program. Um, and so when it's time to bring the crew home, you know, we, we know we owe them a uh, smooth and speedy recovery. So that's our, our priority and our objective. Right. Brian, it's great that you have that personal relationship with them. What challenges do you and the recovery team have to be prepared for? Well, uh, the biggest challenge for recovery uh, for, for Dragon is definitely the weather. Um, we have to find a landing site where the winds are low and the waves are low. Um, so SpaceX has um, several landing sites around the state of Florida that we can look at and choose the best weather. Um, Beyond that, you know, we start looking at things like contingencies if the crew is injured and we've got helicopters on standby for a medevac if we need to. Um, and, then, you know, there's also just built in redundancy on the ship and, and throughout the vehicle. So, uh, but yeah, weather is definitely the biggest challenge for landing. Right. Now, weather is a huge challenge in Florida for a lot of things. And after a uh, crew five returns, Brian, you're going to transition to a new role in the commercial crew program, mission manager for crew eight. Can you tell us how you're preparing for that? That role begins 18 months out. So for Crew-8, which launches, launches a year from now, we've already begun those meetings with SpaceX. And so uh, it's pretty exciting to be a part of that uh, that early in the mission. And uh, yeah, I'm just honored and, and proud to do that for the program. Of course. Well, congratulations, Brian. So glad to have you here tonight. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you, Jasmine. And we are currently now two hours and seven minutes and counting as we watch the SpaceX closeout crew Close the hatch to the Dragon capsule. Dragon Endeavor, the flight leader in uh, SpaceX's fleet with flight number four today, hopefully get off the pad and 
notch another flight under its belt. Countdown is proceeding nominally at this point. On board Dragon Spacecraft Endeavor, we've heard the communication checks between the Dragon team and the crew. The astronauts, uh, you can see them seated. They were rotated into flight position. We had their suit leak checks. That was successfully completed. Yep, and you heard the call from uh, <coughs> the core prior to the uh, hatch closing about making sure that the, all their loose items were stowed. That's kind of key, because once that hatch is closed, if you drop anything, that's a, that's a problem. Um, so you can see right now they're probably updating their notes. Uh, the hatch is closed. You'll probably hear at some point SpaceX confirm the hatch is closed. They're watching on the bottom of each of their displays. It always shows the flight computer state. And what that state tells you is uh, it's sort of major phases that the vehicle is in, are, is in. And then it's important to the crew because only certain commands are available in a particular state. So once hatch is closed, and that kicks off the next sequence of events. I thought it was interesting you mentioned this uh, during our first launch attempt. There's a state that you move into where you know, the emergency handle Dragon is Dragon SpaceX, com check over ground station. That's one of those states. Correct, SpaceX Elliot. SpaceX Dragon, have you loud and clear over the ground station? But it's not active in all the states leading up, so it's certainly a very definitive point in time. Core has you loud and clear. Ground station com check is complete. Stand by for Tedris com check. Now we're rolling through the com checks. These are with the different... Uh, v different paths. So we had yeah. checked via the hard line communication. Now the hatch is closed, so it's a... The first one you heard was the ground. Now it's through TDRS, which is the S-band communication system. So basically through satellites. And that's important because once it gets off the pad, uh, line of sight will work for a certain amount of time, but eventually you're going to have to rely on satellite communication. So they're checking that out before they get to orbit. Afterwards, the SpaceX closeout team will be performing the final leak check on the hatch. And then once that is finished, you can see it there, it's closed. The team will begin steps to ready the access arm for Dragon the SpaceX com check. SpaceX Dragon, have you loud and clear? Core, loud and clear. Teacher's com check is complete. Stand by for com checks with DC, MD, and LD in the launch configuration. And so what they're checking now, the MD is mission director, LD is launch director. Dragon, DC on countdown one, com check. DC Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? DC, loud and clear. Stand by for com checks with MD. Now, while this is Dragon, happening, MD on countdown one, com check. The closeout team will leave the pad at T minus one hour, so they'll stay MD, here. MD, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? They'll be with them for the next hour and then leave at MD, T minus MD, loud and clear. Minutes. Stand by for com check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon to ground, com check. MD, Dragon, have you loud and clear over Dragon to ground? MD, loud and clear. Stand by for com checks with LD. Dragon, LD on countdown one, com check. LD, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? LD, loud and clear. Stand by for com check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon to ground, com check. LD, Dragon, have you loud and clear over Dragon to ground. LD, loud and clear. Dragon SpaceX, launch configuration, com checks are now complete. SpaceX Dragon copy. And so those two nets you hear him talk about, uh, as you can imagine, in, in both Mission Control, MCCX, which is in Hawthorne, and then MCC Houston, uh, each of the flight controllers has a whole bunch of different channels they can be on. So Dragon to ground is what the crew is typically talking on, and there's a whole lot of other comms going on that the crew doesn't need to hear, but those key people uh, have a net that does talk directly to the crew that's not Dragon to ground. Countdown 1 is what they're talking on. And so for the launch, they tie those two nets together for the period of launch itself, uh, specifically to be able to tell the crew to initiate a launch escape. And uh, to your point, Daryl, you're exactly right. The handle that's between uh, Woody and Steve that you can't see in this 
for you. It's up by the displays. It's essentially like an ejection handle, so you can pull that and it'll initiate a launch escape. But exactly like you said, it wouldn't do it right now. You could pull the handle, nothing would happen. Um, so it is only armed, and that's we'll hear that later in the in the count uh, when they say LES armed, and that's why that's such a key thing. Was that handle is hot, which is the manual initiation, but that also means the automated system is hot, meaning if the vehicle detected something, it would also automatically initiate uh, a launch escape. Um, but the reason they tie all those people together uh, is, especially during ascent, um, you want the quickest word to the crew if there's something that would tell them they should manual initiate and escape. And that's why they make sure that those uh, those loops are properly tied. So it's on the ground that they're doing that. It's pretty much Dragon transparent SpaceX to the crew. Commencing health check for launch escape system. Expect momentary flight computer state change, followed by transition back to pad hatch closed. There's that state change we were talking about. Right. SpaceX Dragon will be watching. Thank you. And so why that's, so they're not arming it yet, but what they're doing is checking the automated parameters. So they put it uh, into a mode to, to look at the automated triggers to make sure none of them are showing out of limits because right now sitting on the pad, it looks, it should be fine. So if there was something that's like a bad sensor or bad telemetry, you'd want to know that now before, before you put it into automated mode and then inadvertently trigger an escape. So that's what they're checking. So just like we talked earlier in the broadcast about the T-tab, you know, is it a bad sensor or is it actually a bad thing? That's what they're checking now, just to make sure there's no bad sensors in uh, the system that would initiate a launch escape. Curious, in your training, Raj, what what would constitute a, a moment where you would pull that handle versus it going off automatically? Uh, it would be for like a something uh, where, so there, are, there could be some situations where the rate is low enough that you they you know you know something's wrong, but it hasn't hit the threshold yet to mm. trigger it. So waiting for the automatic system is just taking extra time, so you might as well manually initiate. There could be some cases of fires where you would do it, where you recognize it before, uh, so especially like a fire, that might not trigger the automated system. I see, um, and or you can clearly exactly, see. Exactly, uh, or if there's a failure of the, the, the communications, not the communication, like talking system, but basically the communication path, the interface between the vehicles, mm -hmm. where essentially it eliminates the automation and then you would manually do it. So there's, there's a few cases you would be very, hesitant to do it, you'd want to be very confident, right? Because it's right. A, oh, it is absolutely. a uh, emotionally significant event. <laughs> uh, both from a, you know, the, it is... Um, physically and Physically, yes, yeah. It is uh, a lot of Gs very fast. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, it's going to rock and roll you quite a bit. Um, so you don't want to do it uh, if you're not positive. But uh, you definitely want to use it. It's a great feature to have, um, and definitely one of the, the lessons we've learned as we've evolved um, our, our space and launch vehicle technologies. You mentioned speed, 436 miles per hour. That system can get up and go, take you two and a half miles off the coast of uh, you know Florida here into the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, it could be a lifesaver uh, if the situation were to arrive. So this is certainly not child's play we're talking about here. This is, uh, this is big time stuff uh, when it comes to space flight. But, you know, every Dragon astronaut crew, even though it's not child's play, <laughs> does bring a stuffed toy with them. This is true, yeah. Making a tough transition here. <laughs> that's that's uh, well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> the purpose it. of that stuffed toy, though, it, it, it has a purpose. When the toy starts floating, the strapped-in crew has confirmation that they've reached microgravity, and the name of it is a zero-G indicator. There's been seven on Dragon so far, and let's take a look at them all. Who can forget this one? A little guy, plush Earth, floating around by himself on the first uncrewed flight test in 2017 called Demo-1, which four years ago today, Raja, oh, wow. it was launched. Wow. That was followed up by a, se a sequined bedazzled dinosaur named Tremor, picked out by Bob Binkin's son, Theo, and crewmate Doug Hurley's son, Jack. We just talked about Dragon that. Dragon SpaceX, good side hatch leak check. Crew One took a toy Baby Yoda with them to the first four-person crew. SpaceX Dragon copies. And then, since then, it's been all stuffed animals. A penguin for Crew Two, a turtle, your turtle, for Crew Three. And then for uh, Crew Four, it was a turtle and a chimp. Double turtle. Double turtle. <laughs> and then for the last mission, the first humanoid, <laughs> the little <laughs> Albert Einstein, little thinker, plush doll. And so we didn't get to find out in our first attempt what Crew 6 is doing. Well, I'll be honest. 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're saving it until they get up into space. And we should see it we, you yeah, know, once they get up exactly. there. Yeah, and the history of it is, uh, is you notice in some of those pictures the crew was already out of their seats, but in reality, the when you first see it deploy, they're still strapped in. And so even though you in your stomach have that feeling of being in a roller coaster and you're falling, you aren't actually moving. You're still fully strapped in. So the way you can check your senses is your zero-g indicator starts to starts to float. Um, and so in our case, uh, our turtle was named Fow, which was a nod to Matthias, since that's mm -hmm. uh, German. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also specifically a peacock turtle, because Tom Marshburn is a class uh, in the peacock. So it was a a, a conglomerate of effort to have a, a zero G indicator that represented the whole crew. You heard Arthur call the side hatch leak checks are good, which is a great sign. Um, and uh, it's going to take a while now for the closeout crew to actually clean out the white room. Um, there's a whole bunch of work they're doing um, as they start to, to do that, but it looks like everything's on track. Yeah, we've had the comm checks, the seat rotation, suit leak checks, they're complete. And uh, so now we're just tightening up that hatch. And while we look at this shot, we can look to the right. We see the NASA meatball with all the signatures around them, along with the SpaceX logo. Every human who goes into space gets to put their signature on the wall there. And Raja, of course, yours is there, along with your crew three crewmates. But, you know, Dragon for the second SpaceX attempt, status update. they didn't have to do it. <laughs> so that helps save Final some time, time there as well. SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. All right, uh, we are going to repeat the ground station comm check uh, just to do it one more time on our end and make sure that we're properly configured. Uh, following the ground station comm check, I'll step into the post ingress crew briefing. And uh, after that, we'll step into Falcon 9 operator comm checks. SpaceX Dragon copies, understand it all. Thank you. Going to run the. Uh Com checks again. Yep. So probably maybe they had to reconfigure something, uh, or maybe someone wasn't on the or didn't hear it. Maybe so they want to make sure everyone's tied in. And then you heard the Falcon 9 operator com checks after that, which we haven't done. And that will be when you hear the different subsystems for each of the Falcon 9, ma the main parts that they're monitoring that could lead to a launch escape. They'll all chime in, and again, so for the same reason I described before, making sure. Uh, normally those people wouldn't talk directly to the crew, oh. um, but if you had, you know, you know. Uh, one of those systems that give that that was your question like hey when would you do it like well that, that would be a time like if the GNC which is guidance navigation control had, see something off um, that they think is dangerous they can have the ability to call the crew directly and, and tell them to initiate a launch escape okay great and again, insight it'd be, it'd be like a trend they're seeing you know maybe it hasn't hit the automated limit um, but they know it's going to and so if it buys you a second or two then it's worth worth might that be call. faster than the automated system right and that's why they're consolidating the communications to the crew, as Raja has mentioned. We have uh, an hour and 53 minutes until liftoff at 12.34 a.m. Eastern time here from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, America's spaceport. Now as the pad team wraps up its final checks and clears the white room, that's when the action will start to pick up. We're looking forward a little bit. Crew access arm will retract. We have the arming of the launch escape system. And then, of course, prop load. So we will keep this live view of the crew here as they're sitting tight for the next hour or so. Raja Chari doing a great job of keeping us uh, informed about what's happening as we watch it. And if you want to ask him a question, we're taking them. Just head on over to social media. Oh, great question actually on there. So, so actually the ones that not, one's not a question was a shout out from uh, Steve Bowen's uh, fellow submariners, submariners. <laughs> um, looks like we've got one here that uh, from at Danny Scarra. Okay. Uh, what happens after you're strapped in and waiting to launch and you have to use the bathroom? So we get really good at using diapers. They're called mags. Uh, what are they called? Mags, which is the acronym for Maximum Absorbency Garment, but it's basically a diaper. <laughs> uh, it's just that way you don't have to say the word diaper. It's diaper. <laughs> um, Giving us some great insight yeah. there. Well, actually, if How you want, if the people at home, don't try this if you're watching the Cosmo Wave, because there's fire ants. But if you're at home and you want to know what it's like, just get on your back, put your feet up on your couch, and lay on your back and watch this broadcast and do it for the next two hours. And even if you haven't drank a lot of water, 
sitting like that. It's hard to it, do. It's no, it's hard to do, and it makes you have to go to the bathroom. Oh. Um, so you definitely, uh, that's one of the reasons that crew, we call it crew time on back, is a big deal in trying to minimize that uh, because you can get cramps. This is uh, definitely more roomy than a, like a Soyuz um, where your knees are in your chest. But, yeah, it is, uh, it is less than comfortable. Um, and so you have to overcome the mental block of peeing your own pants um, <laughs> because it's actually harder than you would think. But <laughs> we, get, uh, we get practice doing that in NBL runs. So because you're in the pool for you like... You practice. Yeah. Well, you're, when you're doing NBL runs, you're in that suit for like eight hours um, ah. in a mag also. So right. that's kind of where you start. Um, then actually when you're in training, uh, we, we call it like day in the life sims when you do like a whole day in the dragon. And so, yeah, you're, you get used to using it. Um, but that's exactly what you do. You saw the reason we cut away when they pulled up to the pad is there's actually a trailer behind the launch pad where they can use the bathroom one more time um, before they go up the elevator. And you try to never leave a bathroom or a runway behind you uh, if you're flying. Uh, and never, leave, never pass up the chance to use a bathroom. But yeah, so it's a fine balance because you want to be hydrated, especially when you get to space, because you tend to get dehydrated. So you want a fluid load. Um, but the downside is that uh, especially when you're on your back with your knees in your chest, um, it tends to give you the sensation that you have to go to the bathroom. This is an uh, incredible insight here, uh, Raj, uh, and I imagine you've uh, created probably a little bit of stir uh, on <laughs> social <laughs> media right now as people are <laughs> bandying about the, the answers and the insight that you just gave. But I will say this, in my time in being around astronauts, the whole bathroom and space uh, combination is one of the most consistently asked questions. Oh yeah, it, but right. it's actually a pretty it, big deal. It, it is, right. uh, I mean, as we look at Orion design and Artemis design, I mean, if the toilet breaks, I mean, you're coming home. I mean, you, you, mm -hmm. you right? right? If you get into orbit on the Orion <laughs> checkout and the toilets malfunction, I mean, it's a big that's, deal. That's a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. Um, I mean, it's if you look at uh, on the space station, that's one of the you know if the toilet goes down, that is all hands on deck to fix it because that is a big deal. I mean, if you've got seven people that can't go to the bathroom, things are, you only have so many diapers. I <laughs> can only imagine. Well, with that, let's head over now to Houston for a closer look at what the crew will be doing when they reach their destination. And that's where we turn to Courtney Beasley. Courtney? Thanks, Daryl. Once Crew-6 arrives at the International Space Station, they'll officially become Expedition 68 flight engineers. Once on board, they'll do something known as a direct handover, basically saying that Crew-5 and Crew-6 will be aboard the space station all together until Crew-5 comes home. Crew-5 will be able to give Crew-6 an orientation and show them the ropes, which might be particularly helpful for the three first-time space flyers on this flight. NASA's Woody Hoberg, UAE astronaut Sultan al Nyadi, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Fedayev. A direct handover also helps ensure a continuous U.S. presence on the space station, which is a record we've held for more than 22 years now. And as the station is first and foremost a laboratory, the crew will jump right into conducting experiments with new research still to be delivered on upcoming cargo flights. But for now, we'll toss it back over to Jasmine Hopkins, who's with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Courtney. Yes, we're back here at Kennedy on the balcony of OSB2 and right now so honored to be joined by Administrator Bill Nelson. Thank you for being here. It's another pleasure. <laughs> of course, we're always glad to have you back at Kennedy. And Bill, right before uh, we were tossed to, you actually just mentioned that you've been in the shoes of these astronauts before, that when you were flying on shuttle, you scrubbed, it scrubbed four times. Uh, so do you have any words of wisdom, any words of encouragement for the astronauts tonight? Well, um words of encouragement enjoy yourself while you're laying there strapped in on your back uh, trying to get off the face of the earth but the serious words of encouragement is we don't fly until we think it's safe and that was what was important about the first scrub uh, because it just didn't feel right and nasa made the call it was the right call uh, everything's looking good. Uh, the supposed uh, problems that they had before have all been fixed. And so I expect we're going to see a launch tonight. Right, we're all looking forward to seeing that launch tonight, Bill. And all the work that we're doing in low Earth orbit on the space station is really paving the way for deep space. So what is next for Artemis? Well, we uh, have just this unbelievable opportunity now to go back to the moon, but this time it's different. 
First of all, we're going to a different place on the moon. It's the South Pole. And that's where we think the water is. And if you get to harvest water, all of a sudden you have hydrogen and oxygen. You've got rocket fuel. Uh, we're also going back for a different reason. We're going to stay there. We're going to learn to live, to work there, to invent, to create, all for the purpose that we're going to Mars. And, uh, you know, the moon's just a few days away. Mars is months and months away. And so that's why uh, this is so important for us to get back to the moon. It really is important. And right now we're also focusing on going together. Uh, in the commercial crew program, this is the second time that we've partnered with uh, Roscosmos, but the first time that we have a UAE astronaut on board. Can you talk about how these international partnerships really help NASA's mission? Uh, it's a different uh, mission. You pointed it out, not only, by the way, with our international partners, but with our commercial partners. Because when we go to the moon with the NASA rocket, we're going to go into lunar orbit and we're going to join up with a SpaceX lander. And then our crew will then go down to the surface for six days. Uh, so it's, it's a whole new kind of program. Now, internationally, this has become a big deal. You just can't imagine the enthusiasm around this globe with our foreign friends, how popular NASA is. And they all want to be a part of this program, and most of them are. So tonight we have UAE and Russian astronauts. But uh, look up on the station right now. Uh, they're not only Russians, but there are, uh, there's also a Japanese astronaut up there. And so uh, it is a very international program, particularly on the space station, uh, because there we've got 16 international partners. Right, it really is important. We go further when we go together. Administrator Nelson, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Of course. Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine and Administrator Nelson. And we are now T-minus one hour and 44 minutes from launch as we uh, look at the pad here. Dragon on top of a Falcon 9 with a crew access arm. Attached at the moment, but getting ready to retract. As we look at it now, we want to also take a closer look at some of the life-changing science that astronauts are performing aboard the destination, the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board space station. Watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. I gotta tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long-duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The spectacular vantage point of more than 200 miles above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, and plant life. The orbital perspective that we have here on the ISS is just absolutely amazing. Earth is gorgeous. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time.
We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. Love the shot of the cells there, the heart cells beating inside uh, microgravity. It's uh, really impressive. And inside this dragon, three astronauts and one cosmonaut going up to the International Space Station to continue that important work of science on our orbiting laboratory. Well, there are astronauts in place and our cosmonaut getting ready for liftoff at 12.34 a.m. Eastern Time, Crew 6. Still got a ways to go. We've got to arm the launch escape system, got to fuel up the rocket, count it down, and launch it into space. In the meantime, our next guest played a key supportive role in the development of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft, and we visited with him on the first attempt, and he's back. His name is John Posey, and he's NASA's Crew Dragon lead engineer. Appreciate you having you back. Thanks for having me back. John, you were on the console yesterday as we counted down, or I'm sorry, not yesterday, Sunday, I should say, right. overnight during the first attempt, and we were just talking about you know, how NASA and SpaceX works through something like that. Just to recap, there was a clogged filter for the engine ignition fluid. Um, that They saw the data, but weren't exactly sure at the moment what the cause was, found out later what it was, cleared it out, fixed it, and here we go again. How does NASA and SpaceX work through something like that? Dragon SpaceX, yeah, no confirm so when ready uh, for know, comm checks with Falcon 9 operators. On the, on the loops, on the net, talking to each other. Um, on the NASA side, the, the mission support team that uh, my team and I report up the, up the loop through the chief engineer to the NASA ops manager. The NASA ops manager is in direct contact with SpaceX uh, launch director throughout the whole count, you know, keeping apprised of issues that we can evaluate it as a team, make sure that both SpaceX and the NASA side get comfortable that we're good for crew launch. And so, like, as you said, uh, with the uh, igniter fluid, the T-tab, the pyrophoric uh, fluid that they uh, load into the rocket to ignite the Merlin engines on Falcon 9's first stage, um, they, they provided the supply of the fluid and they were, uh, were expecting to see a good bleed in and start to see a response in the catch tank um, and at first they weren't seeing a response did some troubleshooting and uh, started to see a little bit of response but it was abnormal so you know based on the uh, the response of the catch tank and how that fluid fill was not really in family you know the uh, the team talked through different scenarios you know what could happen if we don't have a, a full bleed in what is the uh, the appropriate course of action? So in the end, uh, I think the team made a really good call to to stand down that attempt. Uh, and then, of course, since then they've they've gone into the system, uh, did find you know like you said a clogged filter, a little bit more oxidation than typical, um, and that's kind of expected over the course of that system's use. Um, and SpaceX does proactively go in and change that filter very frequently. Uh, this one got clogged a little sooner than normal, so. Uh, Caught, caught us a little bit by surprise after you know having a, a good performance on static fire but uh, you know sometimes uh, things like that happen there's so <laughs> many systems so many systems yeah. uh, that have to be just right in exactly. order for a rocket launch to go off so it is impressive when they have something like that and work quickly through it yeah it's, it's to turn it around that quickly is is impressive and like Kathy and multiple people said in light of this it just reminds us space flight is hard <laughs> absolutely and so John now that you're returning for launch attempt number two mm -hmm. how does the team reset for the next attempt yeah you know so the team has had a, a couple days to rest and get uh, you know eyes on the data from the first attempt you know very important so you know we look through all the different uh, performance sensor blips anything that there is to look at make sure that we're good to go today so yeah the team's on console uh, I talked I checked in um, with the folks on console just uh, before coming on air and everything's been going great so you know dragon looks like it's ready to go today and so we'll, we'll keep monitoring right through the the big phases like you said launch escape arm and then uh, if the entire vehicle is ready and ev and everyone's uh, go for flight we'll uh, we'll go get this off the ground today and that's great news the you know everything been going pretty smoothly so far our uh, weather in the ascent corridor is the one thing we're kind of keeping an eye on closely. Right. Keep an eye on a lot of things, but that one is the one that's kind of right on the line there. Um, but so far, looking like we're going to go forward for an attempt, and that's great news. We've got three consecutive days, right, that mm -hmm. we can do it now. So every 24 hours, we have an, an opportunity, a little less than 24 hours, and 
Why is that, that we can go three days in a row? <laughs> well, you know, it's how the orbital mechanics work out, right? For getting to the station, you know, and uh, looking at the phasing times, the duration is important. You know, some days uh, the phasing time to get to the International Space Station would just be too long for the crew to be, you know, inside there for three, four days. So we try to get, you know, shorter opportunities. Uh, of course, you know, we, we're protecting for contingencies, right? If, the, uh, if we go on a, a very long phasing, and then had an issue docking, had to re rendezvous, come back, had bad weather. You know, we protect for a lot of extra days of capability in the cabin as, uh, as Raja is well aware. So, you know, just protecting for those opportunities and picking the, the best times to get to station. Well, we hope that this is the one, the yes. second attempt, and we won't have to visit those other two opportunities. John Posey, Crew Dragon lead engineer, thanks for being here for NASA. And uh, we know you're now headed on console, headed over there to do your job. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, well, good luck tonight, and thank you again for being here. Right. And now we'll head out to our VIP location where our Jasmine Hopkins is with a pair of special guests. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, the energy is picking up here at OSB2 as we march closer to launch. And right now, I'm so glad to be joined by Salem Almari, the Director General of the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, as well as Haza Al Mansouri, UAE astronaut. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course, Salem, we'll start with you. Uh, Sultan is the first UAE astronaut to go on a long duration mission to the space station. He'll be on a six month science mission. So what is the UAE hoping to learn from him? Uh, definitely there's a lot we plan to do during this mission and learn from him and from this six month duration. So uh, there's a lot of science we're going to be doing, a lot of human life sciences. Uh, there are science with over 20 different experiments with UAE universities and international universities. So that's something really big for us. Uh, but we also have a very in-depth education program where we, try, we will try and reach every school kid in the UAE. Uh, doing simple science experiments, uh, simple YouTube videos, and of course, uh, other than that, we'll do a lot of PAO events where we have these live chats with astronauts, with the astronaut from space, with our kids and uh, public. So I think there's, we're quite excited for this, uh, for this six-month duration mission. Right, a lot of excitement surrounding this. Haza, uh, you said that you've actually been able to speak to Sultan in the duration from uh, sun or Sunday or Monday's uh, morning attempt uh, to now. So how is he feeling uh, getting ready for launch again? Uh, Sultan, he's uh, super excited about his launch. It's going to be his first mission, uh, first mission for also Woody and uh, Andre Fudayev. They are super excited. Uh, they can't wait to to experience the weightlessness and to just to start conducting science and to conduct experiments on board the International Space Station. It is a really beautiful night for launch, so hopefully it's going to happen today. And uh, we are uh, looking forward to see them floating within a couple of hours. Yeah, we really are looking forward to that. It is a beautiful night for launch, so everybody's looking forward to it. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Of course. Daryl, back to you. All right. Thank you, Jasmine. And we are now T-minus one hour and 33 minutes until liftoff of Crew-6 from the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. You're watching live coverage of the Crew-6 launch. We Monitoring heard. the crew inside, and uh, we've had some great, great interviews, but in the interim during that time, we heard that we're working no issues, and the team is moving forward through the countdown. Yep, and we heard uh, good comm checks. You heard uh, earlier, right before we interviewed uh, John, that they were going to redo the ground checks. So it sounds like those were done successfully, and uh, all checks were good. And uh, yeah, as you saw, you know, we mentioned in that ISS video the science going on there, and you can see underneath Woody's feet just some of the science. Um, so this on average each increment, so they'll be part of Expedition 68 and 69 when they get out there, uh, running about 300 experiments in increment, which is just incredible when you think about uh, you know, what that national lab is doing up there and with having four people go up at a time just allows so much more bandwidth mm. uh, in science. And I mean, I think that's the reason I think most of us do the job, just some exciting changing things. I think my favorite experiments we did up there, I, I call them dual purpose things, so uh, some water, uh, reclamation and then the carbon dioxide scrubbing things and we were doing those things uh, because they help us with exploration so if we can have 98 percent of our water reclaimed then we can meet the mass margins to go to mars and if we can scrub co2 again we can we can live in on the moon and on mars but the cool thing about those technologies is if you scale them on earth i mean think about reclaiming 98 percent of our water oh, that, that it, and or yeah. our, uh, solving our co2 problems i mean these are existential species changing technologies mm -hmm. and just to the, the you know 
that we're just starting to get into the fundamentals of, and if we can solve some of those problems, I mean, the, the impact uh, NASA can have just on, on the world, let alone the solar system, is, is mind-boggling. So I think that's, to me, why I love this job and why I think so much of us love doing this and the things you can discover in a micro-gravity gra environment. Um, even, even simple things, like uh, we did a concrete hardening experiment when I was up there. I remember that. Which them. I thought at the time was like, how? <laughs> well, <laughs> Why are we I, I'm sorry for whoever the poor scientist is like, yeah, how lame is this? Watch it, <laughs> literally watching concrete harden. But Matthias, who's a brilliant materials uh, scientist, explained to me, so that the, the reason we were doing it was to be able to use regolith on the surface of the moon to build structures. Mm -hmm. But the other cool earth science part is, apparently concrete hardening releases CO2 and it's a ridiculous amount of carbon we put in the in the atmosphere on the Earth, huh. just from the process of it hardening. So one of the side benefits is this is figuring out better ways for concrete to harden. And you think about all the developing places in the world, if we just gave them a simpler concrete formulation that didn't emit greenhouse gases, again, just game-changing stuff. So uh, really cool that you know each increment is going to do that, and this national lab is just paying huge dividends besides teaching us how to live and work in space and get to the moon and Mars, but also changing our life uh, every day. There have been spin-offs from space ever since. You know, the space program came into existence and it's amazing to hear just how many continue to come and benefit, not just us, but humanity. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, that's actually more data than we know what to do with one of the common problems, or not oh, problems, right, but uh -huh. people are like, what's, what's the most important experiment you did? Like, I, it's hard to say. I mean, every, yeah. every day we're doing someone's life's work, some universities, you know, years of research, and we get to be the ones that actually finish the execution of it. So it's just an amazing experience up there. And what a privilege to yeah. be able to do that. We are currently at T minus one hour and 30 minutes until Dragon flies its next four person crew to the International Space Station. The astronauts, as we can see earlier, and now as we look at the spacecraft, there they are. Commander Stephen Bowen, pilot Woody Hoberg, and mission specialist Sultan Al Nayadi and Andrei Fedyev. In their seats, they're strapped in, ready to go. And along our, la our launch timeline at the moment, we're getting ready to have those launch escape system and communication checks conducted by the Falcon launch team. And we'll be listening in for that call out. Yeah, so the closeout crew is presumably still working uh, items there. And we expect around uh, at T minus an hour is when they would probably start departing. Um, and then that, that gives them time to clear out the, uh, what we call the hazard zone uh, before they start working the, the, the launch escape systems. Each Crew-6 astronaut is allowed to bring a few personal items with them inside the Dragon capsule there, and they do that so they can have something for their roughly six months in space, you know, something from Earth to remind them of family, friends, loved ones, something they love about planet Earth. And here's a few of the items that uh, Crew-6 is taking up. Sultan Al Nayadi said he's bringing a kimono. <laughs> he's he's going to be throwing some moves up there, some jujitsu. He's also bringing a small toy rocket from the popular European comic Tintin. Andrei Fedyev is taking a few photos and some pins he plans on sharing with his family when he gets back home. For NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg, he's bringing one simple item, a photograph with deep personal meaning to him. In terms of personal items, mine's uh, simple. Unfortunately, over the summer, I, um, I lost my father, and uh, so I'm just bringing a, a photo of him that means a lot to me. And uh, I wish he could come along with me, but uh, at least I'll, I'll, well, I will be bringing him along yeah, with me. So. Yeah. I'll, to, I'll talk this to Yeah, and this is the photo right here, Raj. Woody says it's a picture of his dad, Jim Hoberg, finishing the Boston Marathon and leaving it all on the course. Jim Hoberg, along with his wife, Peggy, Ray's Woody and his brother in Pittsburgh, PA. He was an electrical engineering professor at Carnegie Mellon University, where he was known for his exceptional teaching. When he was 75 years of age, uh, he passed away at 75, I should say. Woody says he will remember his father for always showing up and for his relentless pursuit of truth. When he gets to space, he's going to keep that photo in his crew quarters, a touching tribute to his father all the way up there in space. Yeah, and I think what a, a tribute, and like we were talking about before, none of us got here on our own. Someone got us here, uh, and you know, Woody's dad made Woody who he is. All of our parents made us who we are. The instructors at JSC, the centers we visit, uh, we are really just a, a reflection of them. So it, uh, I'm glad Woody's able to take his, his father with him 
I think most astronauts take things to remind them of their family, their loved ones up with them because you are uh, separated from the, from the Earth. But uh, it's, it's right there, but you, you can't go home at the end of the night, so having that to remind you is very important. Now here's what we talk about, what you brought up, and we did this last time, but... Yeah, I, changed, I had to change my show and tell, yeah. I, I love that you did that, by the way. Right. What do you have? So uh, I, I, last time I had my academy shirt, I also had a high school shirt. So uh, I, you my, brought two I, shirts. I had two shirts, yeah. Okay, so what, what do we have Columbus here? Sailor, so from, from okay. Waterloo, Iowa. Yeah, so I grew up Waterloo, in Iowa. Waterloo, Iowa, that's right. My high school shirt. One thing, so we, sh we showed these last time. Yeah. The, um, showed my space retainer, <laughs> retainer. which I, I was <laughs> also not supposed to bring back. How can I forget? Um, so I did. I showed last time we had uh, the RMO for our mission. The other th one I brought up. So my wife works for the Department of Veterans Affairs, and that's obviously near and dear to my heart. The oh. agency itself. So yeah. I brought up uh, an RMO or a s coin. I'll say it out loud. But uh, <laughs> from from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, the other thing we bring up uh, that they ask some of the astronauts is uh, a Mach 25 patch and 100 day patches. And then you fly those and also things called Silver Snoopies, which are pins that we give out to a very small percentage of the NASA workforce. So it's really special to get one that's flown in space and specifically from one that was flown by an astronaut for you. This is uh, similar, not Silver Snoopy, but a pendant with our patch on it. And we flew these uh, for some of the key people. So um, for some of the folks that helped with our mission planning and training. So you can see the three on there. Yeah. Um, and so the ones, that are yeah, ones that are flown in space are obviously highly sought for. Uh, cards for my kids. I had lots. Oh, of I didn't see this. Yeah, one. these are different ones. I told, I told, I had lots. My 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 wife is is definitely my better half, and so I had all kinds of cards and notes for my kids, including. Oh, look at this, look at uh, what this one says right here. Can't wait. Yep, and a little, a little landing one in the water. This one's the planets complete with the rings of Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know she loves her daddy because right here, this is the capsule. It says Crew Three on it, and <laughs> here are the kids at the bottom, <laughs> and they have a little. They're saying. It's dad coming <laughs> home. Oh, my gosh. And then an uh, interesting one we didn't talk about. We talked about what uh, Nick Hag Ninja 12 is helping. Uh, but so a lot of us fly up with glasses. I don't wear glasses, but um, people have heard the term sans. So your eyes, your vision shifts in space. And so what happens it is shifts. it shifts. So what happens is the fluid in your body pushes up. And what can happen, or this is the leading theory, so we're actually still trying to figure out exactly what, what happens, mm. but the leading theory is that that fluid pushes against the back of your cornea and it changes the shape of your eye. And so they fly us up, so I actually, these are glasses I had with me in the Dragon, uh, in the event that my vision shifted enough that I would have a hard time reading the display. Put those on real quick and show us what that uh, look is. I think like. you're just trying to humiliate me now. Yeah. So <laughs> I, now I can't see the screen though, the teleprompter. So I'm oh, taking yeah, back yeah, off. But yeah. quite, I can uh, see up close really well. That's what it's meant for: is is up close vision. Yeah. And and the strap, of course, to hold it on your face. Exactly. Because, this uh, is the space the space strap. The yeah, space exactly. <laughs> well, space modified glasses. But did you have to use them? Uh, so actually, I used. Well, my my near vision did get worse, but not bad enough. I couldn't see dragon displays, but it would stress, it would fatigue my eyes using the laptops on station. So for about the first, from like, uh, like the first month, I'd wear them, and then my eyes adjusted and I stopped wearing them. But for about a month, I would just to avoid eye fatigue, and then once I got back, they they generally go back to normal. And well, that's good. And uh, we continue or to work on finding out. We do, yeah. What exactly the cause is? Uh, well, especially because we know they well. They generally go back to normal, but that's why we need more long-term data because we don't know on a two-year mission to Mars, like would it would it go back to normal? Are we are we confident? But what would happen there? Well, exactly. that's good stuff. Thank you for sharing yeah, the no new. I don't. Hopefully, we'll have to get to a third <laughs> one. Not. We have to dig up some more stuff. But we appreciate your wife giving us a fresh <laughs> supply of stuff you took to space. Thank you very yeah. much. Well, when they aren't launching into space or working hard to prepare to go into space, the NASA astronaut corps, well, they try to find time to watch their friends go into space. And uh, you would know that. Yeah, so even, so I'm here, but, uh, you know, we saw Nick as uh, Ninja 12. We saw Ike Glover helping with the family sport. We saw Joe Akaba, the chief. Sharon, uh, this is Chen when we're getting ready right, to go exactly. out. Right, yeah. exactly. So the office is spread out doing all kinds of things. You have, uh, you know, last time Reed was up with the administrator. Reed um, Wiseman. Yeah. Exactly. So we are all over the place. But even if you're not, you're probably online or at home watching. And so I was going to try to dial in. So Woody, as we talked about, uh, is sitting in a seat that's been used before. So I was going to try to get. You're not calling Woody, are you? I'm not. Well, I don't think <laughs> I could try call. I don't know the answer. I'm she's a, a, I'm she's a, on the line. Awesome. I'm trying. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we got Megan MacArthur on the line who flew on Crew Two that I got to train with. And so Megan, can you can you hear me? Okay. 
Hey, Russ, I got you loud and clear. Hey, awesome to talk to you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so Megan's at home, and Absolutely. Houston watching the launch, um, and we're, yeah, you might have better ideas about what they're doing. Uh, I think you guys came up with a game to kill some time while you're waiting for the closeout <laughs> crew to leave. Yeah, well, it's been, it's been enough time that, you know, when you first get in, of course, you're all business, and you go through your checklist, and you review the nominal timeline, and you... You, uh, of course, review the contingency actions that you might have to take, but uh, but now you're into just the wait. <laughs> just, and, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to fly with a really fun and fun-loving crew, and so um, we just we set about entertaining each other. <laughs> and, uh, yes. We had Tomas as kind of our Julie, the cruise director, and he had us playing a, a variety of different games that I'm not sure if he made them up or these are French games or what, but he, he kept us well entertained. It looked like the French version of rock, paper, scissors. I'm not sure if that's what it was. but Well, that's what yeah, so it's called the Game of Thumbs, and I won't, okay. I won't um, strain anybody by trying to say that en français, but uh, the Game of Thumbs. And so, yeah, it's a little bit like rock, paper, scissors. Well, Megan, you're watching us, uh, you know, get ready to launch Crew 6. And, uh, of course, you know, you were, you were on Crew 2, and... And what a mission that was. And uh, uh, what's it like to, to be where you are, kind of relaxing, uh, getting ready to watch the astronauts go up? It's, it's so exciting. It's so much fun to see your friends go into space. Um, of course, Steve is a classmate of mine, and Woody uh, was my family escort. Actually, he was with my family when I was oh. getting to launch in that, in that very same seat. And so my son in particular is very excited to get to watch Woody launch, so he's made me promise. I had to peel him away from the screen to get him to go to bed um, with the promise that I would wake him up in time to watch the launch. So we're excited for all four of the crew members of Crew 6, and we, and we can't wait to see them get started on this next phase of their adventure. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, we are counting down just one hour and 20 minutes to go until uh, liftoff. And, uh, you know, i got to ask you, Megan, How's Raj doing so far? Because you were one of our co-hosts <laughs> sitting in this seat. So you want to you wanna grade him live on the air? You could, you could text me oh, any critique. Man. <laughs> you know, how could it be anything else? He's just doing amazing. We are, <laughs> like I said, I had to peel my kid away from the screen. And, of course, he, Raj, he recognized you as the guy that cut his oh, hair. Oh, that's right, yeah. So before the, Daddy came home. His, so. <laughs> his uh, quarantine cut, yeah. I still don't pay for that's haircuts. Right. I cut my own hair. Haircut, yeah. Theo was a test case, yeah. Megan was nice enough to let me test out my haircutting skills on our son. She, really? Wait, wait, yeah. wait. <laughs> he didn't tell me that. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. I, I, use... I tried. I, I did it on other kids. Theo was the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you cut your hair in space. Remember, you, like, you, did you, you some kind of Floby thing that you it's, used? Yeah, it's basically a Floby, yeah. It's a wow. very loud Floby. Yeah. And Megan, were you tr doing your hair in space? No. Oh, no, no, okay. no, no. Huh? We yeah. just let that grow. Yeah, just let it grow out. And uh, I remember seeing oh, the yeah. shot of you, just your hair just flowing freely, and uh, it's a great shot of you floating around. Doing your yeah, business? I often feel like my hair deserves its own credit, you know, in the in the <laughs> credit line, like Megan and Megan's hair, because it's a whole entity on its own. <laughs> Got a lot of traction cool. there. Well, Megan, I just want to let you know that I brought lots of snacks, courtesy of my wife Rachel. She packed me up a big bag here. I know you took a shot at me when your husband uh, <laughs> co-hosted, so I want you to know I'm, I'm in good hands. <laughs> awesome. Can't have you getting grumpy. <laughs> no, no, ma'am. Thank you very much. Well, Megan, we really appreciate you joining us uh, this evening, watching the launch from home. Uh, thank you so much for being on the broadcast with us. Thanks, Megan. I'll see you All back right, in Houston. All right, you guys are doing awesome. Take thank care. You. All right, Megan MacArthur, Crew 2 pilot, uh, and uh, did a fantastic job for us as a co-host, completed an amazing mission. She did a ton of work uh, working with kids, uh, especially afterwards. She's really leading an effort in education. Um, great having her on the broadcast. Hey, take a look at this. This is uh, Crew6's patch. And we want to talk about how this came into existence. You know, it's very unique. Each patch for each mission, every flight has one, and it's designed by the crew. So you can see the one for Crew6, and what you'll notice right away is the wooden dragon ship with the dragon figurehead there. And that's because each crew, six member, has an affinity for seafaring vessels. And then check out the anchor. It's the International Space Station. You see it there. And then lastly, the sail represents the three planetary bodies of Earth, Moon, and Mars, the ultimate destination of NASA's Artemis program. I like that call forward to where we're going, even though this is a mission to low Earth orbit. 
Yeah, that's, I think you, that's a common theme in a lot of the patches. You'll see like a reference to Moon, Mars, uh, Orion, some, something like that. Just, uh, this is, we definitely see this as a stepping stone to, to go beyond low Earth orbit. I mean, that's one of the cool things about commercial crew is we are putting private industry to low Earth orbit so that NASA can, can focus resources and people on exploration and going beyond low Earth orbit. That's right, and we're just one hour and 17 minutes until liftoff of Crew 6. Hearing good things about the countdown as we go along the way. And the crew has ingressed, helped by our closeout team, of course. The umbilicals are attached. They provide the breathing air and comms to Dragon and the astronauts. Suit leak checks completed, comms checks completed with the core and the launch director. After those suit leak checks, the closeout team was able to close and seal the hatch, which has its own leak check. They made sure to look for any FOD that might be there, and FOD stands for Foreign Object Debris. As we look in from the white room, the closeout team will wait another 15 minutes before they'll clear out of that area. You saw those orange bags, so there's no, uh, the people are starting to move out of there, but you saw those orange packs uh, in that previous view just to the right on that wall. Those are actually breathing uh, apparatus in case they have to uh, emergency egress, that they can actually hook into their suits and get breathing air uh, to get all the way off the pad. So we understand that the closeout team has actually departed the pad, and now they're doing some final weather checks. That'll be necessary before they give that final go, no go for launch. Going to put the balloons up into the air. The winds have picked up a little bit, but not too bad at all. Yeah, and a, and a great example, uh, continuing to run ahead of timeline and specifically that closeout crew already being done much earlier than last time. But again, it's there. You know, you can tell it's a well-oiled machine now. They had the practice from just doing this uh, two days ago and now uh, doing it again. Um, when I talked to Steve about, you know, what they've been up to in between... Uh, Talking about Commander Steve Commander Bowen. Steve Bowen, yeah. yeah, between uh, now, last attempt and now. Um, his perspective is very similar to what we talked about uh, the other night. You know, basically an, another free training sim event. And mm -hmm. Steve, um, actually, like I mentioned before, he was the lead closeout person. So he was in that white room uh, for STS-127, which had six attempts. Uh, and so he, he mentioned that he act, that the crew actually got sick of seeing his face because he was always the first person <laughs> to open up the hatch on the shuttle and they would see him leaning in. But I think, uh, you know, he brought up uh, similar to what we talked about. I think everyone on the crew was actually impressed by the fact that, you know, no one had go fever, no one you know, down to two minutes, but no one was like, oh, we should just go. Like, like the administrator said, we go when we're absolutely ready um, and, uh, you know, we have an abort system, but you or an launch escape system, but you don't want to rely on that. Right. Uh, you want to rely on making the right engineering dis decision. Um, and so he actually, you know, talked about the fact that, uh, you know, yes, it's the sixth operational crew mission, but every one of these missions is really a test flight. We're always learning new things. Now we learned about, uh, you know, oxidation rates of T-tab right? line filters. You know, so you're always learning something new. Um, we talked last time about like even the, the procedures they're using. So they're in a procedure called 4.100 and just in the last launch to now, they've changed the section numbers of that. So we're always iterating and improving and trying to figure out ways to, to do it better and more efficiently. Like you mentioned tonight, we're doing things in parallel, which is why now we have some time. So um, it seems like we're ahead, but if we had had a problem with the side hatch closer or had had a problem with the leak checks, we, this would all be time that we could use now to, to not be rushed. Um, so it's, uh, it's great to keep iterating and practicing and learning. It's hard to imagine when you have a launch scrubbed that uh, so much can come from it that's good. Talking about that data, we heard uh, NASA's Dragon lead engineer talk about how they've been pouring over the data. Uh, we've had a dry dress, essentially a wet dress in the first launch attempt, and uh, as you mentioned, always iterating and always learning. All right, we want to check in now with our friends in Houston, Texas, and the Johnson Space Center. Courtney Beasley is standing by. Courtney? 
Thanks, Daryl. The team here in Mission Control Houston has pulled that they are go for launch. The International Space Station is ready for crew six astronauts to lift off. When Flight Director Jed Freeling pulled his team, he was asking the flight controllers who work on all of the key systems on board the station if their focus areas were online and working properly. This includes life support systems, proper communications links, computers that allow us to command the station's onboard subsystems, and our ability to to control and maneuver the space station are all fully functional. The crew in orbit is currently in a sleep period and they are scheduled to wake up at midnight central time. The International Space Station Flight Control Team is ready for launch. Mission Control Houston will continue monitoring the mission as we check off milestones for today's flight. In the meantime, I'll send it back out to the team at Kennedy. Daryl. All right, a beautiful shot from uh, high above. The Kennedy Space Center going by the VAB as we look out at Launch Complex 39A during the previous launch attempt. I want to recall this. Roger told us that dragonflies during dry dress is a good luck charm. Well, after the scrub, I was watching <laughs> you know, the Starlink yes. launch. What do you see there? Looks like some looks like some insects flying by, maybe dragonflies. Yeah, I can't tell if they're uh, insects on the screen or there you go. <laughs> there, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a buzz. Right? They, were, they were buzzing my phone. I thought it would be a good <laughs> idea to put some dragonflies in For the show, good Roger. Luck. I like it, yeah. Is that going to bring us some good luck? I sure hope so. Well, let's <laughs> hope so indeed. One hour and 11 minutes, uh, counting until liftoff. Let's check back in with Jasmine Hopkins, who has a special guest. Thank you so much, Daryl. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center Director Janet Petro. Thanks so much for being here, Janet. Thank you, Jasmine, for having me. We're always happy to have you. And you know, right now we're, we're preparing for take two, second launch attempt of Crew-6, but this is something that the Kennedy workforce is built for, really. I mean, we're very agile. Can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, last year, 60th anniversary, we went through this with Artemis, not just uh, uh, two times, but we did it three times, successfully launching the third time on November um, 16th. So. Launch is hard, the whole process, and we got to get it right. Um, you know, they say, you know, you'd rather fix a problem on the ground than um, launch and then have a problem in the air. So the team, um, you know, the NASA team along with the SpaceX team has worked really hard. We had our uh, Delta launch readiness review um, late yesterday evening, worked through the issues that we experienced on the first one, and we're ready to go tonight, Jasmine. That is what we want to hear. It's good to hear that we are looking good for launch tonight, Jan. And you just mentioned that 60th anniversary it was our diamond anniversary last year. Uh, to think that we've been here six decades, what is Kennedy doing? Uh, to continue growing and improving? So the first 60 years, you know, it started, Kennedy was with Apollo, and then Diamond Anniversary last year, Artemis, first launch of Artemis, going back to the moon. But, you know, as a spaceport, we really have come into our own. We've really um, brought a lot of the commercial industry here to launch. Um, 97, uh, 94 launches on the manifest this year. Um, we had 57 last year, like you mentioned, 31 the year before that. So we are growing. We obviously are a very popular place, not just because of the geography, but the services that we're providing at the center to our commercial partners and customers. Um, we're working very hard to make it easy for them to launch and to provide them the best services. And I got to brag for a moment. Uh, we have a spaceport integration team. They coordinate with the um, uh, 45th, uh, SLD, the Space Force side, every single one of those 90 plus launches uh, will be supported by our Kennedy um, uh, team as well as the Space Force side. We work jointly together in partnership to ensure that all of those um, launches are successful and of that 90 plus, 79, uh, 79 are commercial. So a large, large number percentage of that is a commercial launches and so Across the board, we have our NASA, we have our government, we have our national um, space security missions we support, but we also have the commercial that we have to take care of also. Right, Janet, I mean, those numbers just really blow me away. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course, always happy go, to have you. Go Crew 6. Uh, exactly, go <laughs> Crew 6. Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine and Janet. Throughout the show, we've been taking your hashtag AskNASA questions from social media. We have time for a few more before Falcon 9 fueling begins at T-minus 35 minutes. We're sitting now at 108 and counting. And Raja, there's the question. It seems like astronauts work on some really cool and interesting things other than flying. Raja, can you take a minute and talk about something interesting that you're working on right now. You're not flying, currently right. on a mission, obviously, because you're here. <laughs> so what yeah. you working on? Yeah, so I'd say most of our time is not 
actually flying in space. So we do maintain the training for that, whether it's uh, NBL, which is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, so doing uh, practice spacewalks in there, uh, whether it's working on the ISS systems, uh, working on uh, different experiments, getting smart on geology, biology. Uh, but we also all work on different projects in the office on the engineering and development program. So specifically, there's a whole lot of work going on in Artemis right now. Uh, the administrator talked about Artemis. That is, that is the goal of the agency to get us back to the moon to stay and go on to Mars. Uh, so there's the SLS, which is the rocket. There's the Orion, which is the capsule. Uh, there's the Gateway, which is the Lunar Space Station. And then there's the HLS, the Human Landing System, which is the lander. So that's my particular job right now is helping with uh, lunar lander development and testing. Uh, and so I, I, lo I love my job. I love, <laughs> I love to fly in space, but I also love my, my day job. And so that's, uh, you know, we're doing all different kinds of things. There's uh, folks working on the lunar exploration suits. So those are the space suits for the surface. So mm -hmm. we, we're not going to use, you know, we talked about there's IV suits, which are for in the vehicle. There's EVA suits, which is what we use in the stage station. And we are working on lunar suits because those are, that's different than either of the ones we have. And so if we get to the moon, we are going there to do science. And so we need to get out there and go do the science. So that's another uh, big project that people are working on. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, we are spread all over the place. Uh, training and working with all these development teams. Yeah, and it, and it seems like there's a similarity there to when you know Bob and Doug were working in the commercial crew program early on developing these vehicles. You're very early on in the HLS system, so you know it's, uh, it's got to be kind of exciting to be working on the next thing that's going to land on the moon. Yeah, I think all of us enjoy it. That's why it's fun to do these things. You know, yeah. And our, our job is in the office is to fly in space, but also to bring the crew's perspective, the operational perspective, to all these programs and to, uh, to these efforts to make sure that we're, you know, the, the human is the important part of human space flight. And so keeping that in mind and, and keeping that at the forefront is always really important, and, and that's why it's important to have us tied into all these programs. And for those of us, uh, for those of you who are watching, and for those of us who are enjoying watching, if you want in on the social fun, follow us on Twitter at NASA Social, or check us out on the web at nasa.gov forward slash social forward slash social. <laughs> hey, this is a really quick question, a really easy one. At Slow asks Raja, what inspires you? What inspires me? I think uh, the idea of exploring is what in inspires me, the idea of new discoveries, and I think I kind of alluded to why I'm so excited about science before, solving problems here on Earth. So I'd, I would love to see humanity go and explore, like live on the moon, go to the next planet, but I also am inspired by the fact that we're, we are finding solutions for problems here on Earth right now. So that's, uh, that's what inspires me to, to work here. And it must be rewarding as well. It's amazing, yeah. I, so I think what inspires me is inspiring others too. So I think one of the co coolest parts of our jobs, uh, it takes time and effort because it's you're traveling, but going to talk to like school kids, I, that's hands down one of my the most my most favorite things um, really? to go do. And just yeah, I mean seeing their excitement. Um, just the, when an astronaut walks in the door, it's just so fun, you know. And, yeah. um, you know, whether it's elementary answering bathroom questions, you know, because <laughs> I've heard plenty, uh, all, all, the way, all the way to, you know, talking to university students uh, who have questions like, you know, how do we, like, where do I go and like what kind of degrees and, you know, so it's, it is, uh, it is really cool um, and it's, it inspires me to be uh, even a potential inspiration or to potentially help or set a spark maybe uh, uh, in someone's mind or give them the idea of what's possible. Deep curiosity as well. We are one hour and four minutes and counting until liftoff. This day is the continuation of regular flights to the space station from U.S. soil. Crew 6 and the mission will be the company's sixth crewed space flight. This is for, of course, SpaceX and NASA following the crewed test flight, Demo 2, and four previous operational crewed missions to the space station. It will also be SpaceX's eighth crewed space flight overall, including the private orbital mission, Inspiration4. Today, our crew is uh, flying on board Dragon Endeavor, and this will be the fourth flight for this capsule. And it'll be taking a ride on a brand new Falcon 9 rocket. The Dragon is the flight, this particular Dragon, Endeavor is the flight leader in the fleet. It's fourth flight, which includes Demo 2, Axiom 1, it's been a great countdown so far. One hour and three minutes and counting. Weather is fantastic here at the Kennedy Space Center. Only a 5% chance of violation. That means 95% go. 
doing some math here, getting inspired by my fellow astronaut <laughs> here. Really advanced stuff. Avoid math in public. That's my rule. <laughs> that's a good idea. Excitement is picking up, though, as we get uh, closer to T0. And so with roughly about an hour, sorry. No, no, go ahead. About an hour to go until liftoff, things are going to start picking up. We get close to the go, no-go pole to arm the launch escape system and begin the propellant loading. The crew pole for readiness, that will happen right at T minus 60 minutes. And then the dragon pole for prop load is at T minus 55 minutes. From there, at T minus 45 minutes, there will be an internal mission control Hawthorne pole, and then the launch director's pole for propellant loading will follow. When we get to about T minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract, and the crew will get the call to close their visors and to arm the launch escape system. I'm going to walk you all the way through it. This is the automated safety system that's in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket either on the pad or during a flight on the ride uphill. And then, once we reach about T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's sixth rotational flight of astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station. We are T-minus one hour and counting until liftoff. And with us today is NASA astronaut Raja Chari. Raja, thanks for coming back. Yeah, glad to be back. Hoping to see my first launch. Indeed. And if you didn't know, Raja is getting ready to witness his first launch. He rode on a rocket as we turn the corner from the vehicle assembly building to show off the launch pad just beyond it. Oh, this is a great shot. Got the big reveal. Look at that. It certainly oh, is. Cool. There it is, the Launch Complex 39A, holding for a 12.34 a.m. Eastern time liftoff. And so right now the crew is uh, going through kind of mentally, uh, you know, Probably looking at forward to the prop Dragon timeline. SpaceX and you cycling a orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure. SpaceX Dragon copies for Washington. Quickly explain what that is. So give them that call. So uh, a lot of times whenever they're going to do something with any prop loading or valves, they'll give the crew a heads up. So if they hear the sound or feel the vibration, that they know that that's planned. So they usually give them a call prior. Uh, you mentioned that it's about to get a lot busier on the loops as they start going through some go, no-go poles and uh, talking to the crew. And so they are looking ahead in what's called the event details. And they have probably two displays up, one that's event details, one that's in procedure 4.100. They're sitting in 4.100 waiting for the pole to say that they can arm the LES, the launch escape system. And on the timeline, they're probably looking at what the prop loading steps are and just kind of anticipating what's coming up next, probably scrolling ahead to kind of talk through the launch sequence and using this time to basically what we call chair fly, uh, talk through. Uh, Dragon SpaceX, you are go for section five. When ready, report go for launch. All right, picking up section five, preparation for LES arming. All right, great insight into what's happening in Crew Dragon right now, but we want to recap the last three hours. Our crew of Stephen Bowen, Woody Hoberg, Sultan al Nayadi and Andrei Fedyev have been getting ready to launch into space after waking up and having a meal. SpaceX helped the astronauts into their suits, and then you see them here walking out the historic crew quarters, walking the same path that every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7, waving to family and loved ones as well as to the cameras there to document their journey. Then you see them here inside their Teslas, joined in a caravan as they went down the road led by center security, 
until they arrived here at Launch Complex 39A. They did the rocket recline, went up the tower, and walked down the crew access arm here. Woody Hoberg and Stephen Bowen crawling into Crew Dragon. And then once inside, they got strapped in, got their suits checked, comm checks, and now we watch as the Dragon spacecraft sits on top of the Falcon 9 rocket, getting ready for fueling and arming of the launch escape system. At this time, we are expanding our coverage and would like to welcome SpaceX and NASA commentators who are joining us live from Hawthorne, California. Welcome to you both. Hey, thank you so much, Daryl. And hello to everybody watching around the world. I'm Gary Jordan with NASA's Communications. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a production and engineering manager here at SpaceX. Gary and I are joining you today from our headquarters in Hawthorne, California. While Crew-6 marks SpaceX's sixth operational mission for NASA, it's actually our eighth human spaceflight mission to the International Space Station and overall 34th Dragon mission to the orbiting laboratory. And the Dragon supporting tonight's mission will be making its fourth visit to the station, having previously supported Demo-2, Crew-2, and Axiom Mission-1. And Speaking of Demo 2, the spacecraft was named Dragon Endeavor by Bob and Doug during its inaugural flight in May of 2020. And yet another fun fact, tonight's launch marks our four-year anniversary of the Demo 1 mission, which launched on the same day, just a couple of hours later than we're launching today, which served as an end-to-end -end test flight of Dragon's capabilities. Since Crew 1 in November of 2020, SpaceX has been regularly flying commercial crew missions for NASA to and from the International Space Station at an an average cadence of about one flight every six months. It took a lot of love and dedication to get here today, and we are still learning and innovating from every launch. From the beginning, Dragon was designed to eventually fly people to help further our ultimate goal of making life multiplanetary. The Dragon hanging from the ceiling behind us was initially flown to certify SpaceX for cargo missions to the space station over 10 years ago. It flew back in 2010, but it included a window because the vehicle had been designed from the beginning to fly crew. We always knew that this was the direction that we wanted to go in. As we continue the countdown to liftoff, we'd like to welcome you to SpaceX Mission Control in Hawthorne. This is where our teams are staffed around the clock to monitor Dragon and the mission overall. On console or headset in Mission Control are six key positions. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you may hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, who you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast. And the four additional team members are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. Apart from Mission Control, our Falcon 9 team is currently located in Firing Room 4 in the Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now, with less than an hour until launch, they are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and for launch. And then, of course, NASA has its own team members at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, who have been preparing the space station for Dragon's arrival. And they recently gave their go for launch, saying that the station is ready to receive the new crew. Upon liftoff, today's rocket to the space station will take about 24 and a half hours with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. Now at under T minus 55 minutes, we are looking good for an on-time liftoff and our very own incredible Kate Tice has been monitoring the progress of the countdown. How's it going so far, Kate? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jesse. I'm Kate Tice, SpaceX Quality Systems Engineering Manager, bringing you vehicle status updates this evening. It's been a pretty smooth countdown so far. The Crew-6 astronauts wrapped up ingress at T-minus two hours and 34 minutes. Since then, the teams completed the required comm checks, suit leak checks, and side hatch closure, as well as side hatch leak check. The closeout team has departed the BDA, and the pad is clear. Now, as for Falcon 9, our two-stage reusable rocket that you see there on your screen, final propulsion checkouts of first and second stages began a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. This involves testing valves and engine pneumatic pressurization. Now, as you might be able to guess from the lack of re-entry soot on Falcon 9's first stage, which is the lower two-thirds of the vehicle there, that booster will be flying for the first time tonight. 
Now, at T-minus 45 minutes, less than 10 minutes from now, the team will report their readiness for prop load with a final electronic go-no-go -go poll. Before we can begin propellant loading on Falcon 9, we still have a couple tasks to perform. First, the crew access arm will be moved out of its service position as you see it in now, and it will rotate away from the Dragon capsule and over to its launch position. That will happen between T minus 44 and 42 minutes, almost immediately after the T minus 45 minute launch director's briefing. With the access arm out of the way, the launch escape system will then be armed. Once those two events are complete, Dragon will be ready for Falcon propellant loading. As for weather, we will also verify with the launch weather officer that all of the weather conditions meet our launch constraints. Those include items such as wind speed, lightning, and precipitation in the area surrounding pad 39A. But tonight, we're expecting uh, acceptable weather conditions for launch, both at surface level and upper altitudes. Uh, once again, our uh, probability of violation of those conditions is only 5%, so looking good. The range is currently clear for launch. A worldwide network of ground stations and tracking and data relay satellites, or TDRIS, are ready to support. And those are what help us get live views and data as Dragon heads into orbit. Today, we have an instantaneous launch window at 12.34 a.m. Yeah. Eastern. As I've said before, once we begin propellant load, there is no opportunity to change the T0. The timing for Dragon to rendezvous with the International Space Station is down to the exact second. So today, we only get one chance. But the good news, at T minus 51 minutes and 32 seconds, uh, we and counting, uh, we are go for launch. Great news, thanks, Kate. Today's launch marks the sixth time a rotational crew will fly on a commercial spacecraft. And much like our previous crews, today's crew has been training with our teams at SpaceX for the last several months, running nominal and emergency simulations of what the full mission will look like while seated inside of Dragon. And as with every mission, each one of our crew members brings a diverse set of experience to today's flight. That's right, and let's start with the mission's commander. Steve Bowen was born in Cohasset, Massachusetts. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's in ocean engineering from the Joint Program in Applied Ocean Science and Engineering at MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. In July 2000, Boeing became the first submarine officer selected as an astronaut by NASA. This will be Boeing's fourth trip into space as a veteran of three space shuttle missions, STS-126 in 2008, STS-132 in 2010, and STS-133 in 2011. Bowen has logged more than 40 days in space, including 47 hours, 18 minutes during seven spacewalks. As mission commander, he'll be responsible for all phases of flight aboard Dragon from launch to reentry. Warren Woody Hoberg is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT and a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. He is also a commercial pilot with instrument, single engine, and multi-engine ratings. The mission will be Hoberg's first flight since his selection as an astronaut in 2017. As pilot, he will be responsible for spacecraft systems and performance on Dragon. Sultan al Niadi will be making his first trip to space, representing the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates. Aboard Dragon, he'll serve as a mission specialist, working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He spent time in the UAE military prior to becoming one of the first two individuals selected by his country when they started their space program just a few years ago in 2017. al Niadi will be the first UAE astronaut to fly on a commercial spacecraft. Andrei Fedyaev will be making his first trip to space and will also serve as a mission specialist monitoring the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. He was selected as a cosmonaut in 2012 and will be the second cosmonaut to fly aboard a SpaceX Dragon. Each of these crew members will be a part of Expedition 68 upon their arrival to the International Space Station. Now let's head over to Kate Tice for another status update on the countdown. How's it going, Kate? Thanks, Jesse. Uh, we're coming up to T minus 48 minutes and 40 seconds. The SpaceX launch teams are finishing final review of data from all the checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director has confirmed with the launch weather officer that weather meets propellant loading constraints. So up next will be to pull the team for readiness, both to load propellant and to launch. That will be the final pull prior to liftoff. 
The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they are go by electronically voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director, or LD, also checks with the Dragon mission director, MD, and the NASA launch manager to make sure they are ready. Earlier, you saw the vehicle assembly building called the VAB. The Falcon and Dragon launch team, uh, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the launch control center adjacent to the VAB. You can actually see where they are right now on the right-hand side of your screen. They have a view straight towards pad 39A through those large windows of firing room four. On your screen, you see there the Dragon capsule with the crew access arm still in the service position. The crew is on board Dragon waiting for the next instructions, which will be to stow the crew arm for launch and to arm the launch escape system. Once the launch director gives the final instructions to the launch team in that T minus 45 minute briefing, uh, immediately afterward, the crew arm sequence, uh, excuse me, the crew access arm sequence will be armed and initiated. We should get a good view of that access arm as it swings away from the capsule. That will take about two minutes to complete its rotation to move out of the way. The range continues to be go for launch. They continue to monitor uh, the clearance area around the launch pad, as well as the air and sea space around that uh, downward uh, uh, upstream or uh, the flight corridor downstream from uh, the launch pad. As we mentioned before, we have to make sure that uh, all areas are secure in the unlikely event of a, an abort. There at Kennedy Space Center, the conditions are predicted to be acceptable for launch. Um, you can, if we had daylight, you'd be able to see that uh, conditions are pretty calm. There's uh, 13 mile per hour winds from the south southwest, uh, so pretty mild all in all. The downrange landing zones, as I mentioned before, are also within uh, the conditions as needed, uh, if needed for an escape. So everything also looking go downrange. Now, in about a minute, we will hear the uh, briefing from the launch director. As I mentioned before, uh, the readiness poll that is uh, underway is the final go for propellant load and for launch. There on screen, you can see the four crew members of Crew 6 waiting patiently to go to space. Not much for them to do at this moment, but wait for that LD briefing, which will be coming up in about 35 seconds. As I mentioned before, the team in um, Mission Control, as well as the teams in Firing Room 4, they are basically collectively, both with NASA launch team and the Dragon launch team and the Falcon the launch team. The is complete and the team is ready for crew access arm retract, propellant load, and launch. Both control rooms are going to lock down at T minus 45 minutes and remain in that state until the launch escape system is disarmed. All operators are remain at their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming the launch escape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD, and they'll approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the crown for movement. There we heard that final go for launch and prop load from launch director having Nine, four, two, get started. And there we just heard the call out that the crew access arm retraction is underway. So let's head back to Daryl over at Kennedy as they have a live view of that retraction as it happens and uh, will be the major final physical reconfiguration of the pad prior to launch. Daryl. How's it going? Great, Kate, and uh, thank you very much. As we watch the crew access arm move quickly at first and then rotate away from the Dragon spacecraft, there's the view from inside the crew access arm, the white room at the very end of it. As we can see, uh, the water tower out there. Hitting another milestone here, Raja, on our way to liftoff.
Yep, and the, and the crew is definitely tracking through all this on a uh, timeline. Um, so they're uh, procedurally in 4.100, uh, following that SpaceX is retracting the crew arm and then starting to prepare uh, the next big step they'll be taking is launching, or sorry, arming the launch escape system. And then looking forward uh, on the timeline to basically go through the steps for the prop loading. So we talked a little bit about the first uh, the first broadcast, but uh, there's kind of a key mental note here as well. If there was an emergency pad egress, uh, they probably have some crew coordination of who's going to get to the hatch first, but you definitely want to make sure the crew arm is back in place. So there's this period of time while well, the crew access arm is not there, the launch escape system is not armed. So crew you, access arm retraction complete. You need the arm to swing back to the capsule before you can actually egress. So you need to make sure that's there before you, you step out critically important, and we got some beautiful views from our flight operations team, which is not only uh, making sure that uh, the area around the rocket is safe, uh, but also giving us some spectacular views of that crew access arm uh, as it uh, retracted away from the rocket, and there it is again, right there. Yeah, it's a, it's a great view where you can see the, the, both the strong back, which is the structural piece uh, holding the rocket uh, up there now, and then the crew access arm swung back open now to the air and the atmosphere. Hopefully no dragonflies that far <laughs> up. And we had our own dragonflies earlier, Rog, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're working. We're, yeah, we're, we, we have successfully had good luck here at the, the launch broadcast okay, test. We've done our part. It's feeling good. We're doing <laughs> exactly doing what we can. There's a great <laughs> view, too, of the trunk. So you can see the side, which is the part just below the capsule. That's got the, the avionics radiators for cooling. Uh, and then the left side, that looks black in the picture here is actually the solar panels that generates the power for the, uh, the capsule on orbit. Curious, it looks like we saw a plane off there in the distance and it could be pretty well off given it's dark and night. That might have been the helo out there potentially ah, too. Very good, good call. The countdown, T minus 41 minutes and counting and uh, we're heading down to a launch time of 12.34 a.m. We saw the retraction, that's the last major visual milestone as we prepare for liftoff. Shortly thereafter, we should hear the call out that the launch escape system is armed. And then from there, Raja, we will hear that F9 prop load has started. Yep, and uh, timeline-wise, I'd expect probably about uh, another minute and a half or two, they'll, uh, they'll tell the crew to uh, they'll tell them to go ahead and step into the arming. Um, you'll see them putting visors down. You'll probably see them tugging at the restraint straps, just making sure everything is uh, extra tight, making sure you saw it like Andre before was using his uh, stylus to probably edit some of the, the weather data they had on their iPad. They'll stow all those things and basically put themselves in a posture uh, where you could, you see them stowing it right now, um, where you could be in a posture where if the capsule were to initiate a launch escape, you'd be prepared for that. So from the time that is hot, you are pretty much sitting on a, uh, a live uh, set of Super Dracos that could go off automatically if the vehicle senses a malfunction once the prop loading starts, or it could be manually initiated. So you always want to be ready once that system's hot. Well, Raja, you say it, and then we see it. <laughs> Calling it out. Remember well from your time as the commander of Crew 3. It's yeah. worth noting, you just came back from space. It was, what, May of last year? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's Good to, good to be back. I would I'd, I'd go back in a heartbeat, but it's also good to be back home. But oh, you're watching your friends go up. Yeah, this is a, it's really surreal to have uh, you know, friends and colleagues on the end of that rocket, and I think uh, you know, it just reinforces the importance. You asked earlier, and the, 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 the question was like, what do we do on our normal job? There's also people in our office, uh, so Joe, who's the chief of the office, goes to the, the launch trainers reviews, and you, know, you are signing up your friends to go ride this thing, so we take it pretty seriously, as well we should. You can kinda, strapped in. Yep, you can see just by Andre's left leg, the red of that bag. We were talking about that earlier, but you couldn't Dragon see it. Dragon SpaceX, go for Section 6, close visors, arm launch escape system. All right, we're picking up Section 6 on uh, closing the visors and, launch, and arming the launch escape system. All right, so you see them reaching up to the displays. They're stepping to that section of the procedure all verbalizing now with the visors down, that the Vox settings are correct so they can hear Space each other. Next, Dragon, visors are closed, we're arming the launch escape system. They have some telemetry on their display that shows them what the automatic thresholds are to make sure they're not violating one of those thresholds before they arm the system. We talked about that earlier tonight, um, to make sure you don't inadvertently initiate a launch escape. 
And then we also talked about the flight computer state, so that's what they're watching to actually know. So you actually hear the thunks because those valves that isolate the Super Dracos are in the capsule, so you can actually see like, where that NASA worm is and where the, the US flag is. Yeah, those are the engines. Those are the engines, yeah, yeah. so you're, they're right by your head on the inside, so when you arm it, you can actually hear the sound of the valves opening up, and that's what allows prop to flow to the Super Dracos in mm. the event of a launch escape. Can you hear the prop flow as well? Uh, well, hopefully you never hear that sound. <laughs> oh no, okay, so <laughs> yeah. it, it doesn't bleed in the system? No, but, okay. no. It just opens the valve. Launch escape yeah. system is verified armed. There's the verification yeah. of arming of the launch escape system. Right on time with our milestones as we count down. And so for the crew, they're now closing out 4.100, which is their launch preparation uh, procedure. And they're now stepping ahead to what's the, the prop loading timeline on their displays, which is going to give them times of when is the, the different tanks are pressurizing and loading. There's no telemetry in the Dragon that tells you what the F9 tanks have in them in terms of amount of fuel. You can see what's in the Dragon, but not the F9. And so you rely on this timeline and the calls uh, from the team to know the status, and that gives you an indication based on the timeline you have of things are behind or ahead uh, or on timeline. The team on the ground can certainly see. Yes, absolutely, yeah. The ground team can see that all, uh, but that's not all piped into the Dragon. Tank for propellant load. We'll start venting. These would be the tanks on the ground. Right, so the, the, as they start to, the, they have what's called these giant accumulators that are full of the fuel that they then pump into the, into the, drag, into the F9. And the, the two things I learned on our, our first broadcast attempt, one is that the license plate changes every time. The, <laughs> the second that I also learned from you is that you can tell out here how full the rocket is by looking at the level that the condensation comes off the outside of the rocket, which you, uh, yeah, you can't see that on the inside, but that's a, a good technique for if you're watching on the outside and don't have the benefit of having the displays the crew has or the telemetry the ground has to just get a look at binoculars if you're standing on the causeway or on TV and know how full the tank is. Outdoor fuel gauge. Yeah. Only wow. if you launch in the humidity of Florida. I don't know if it'd work <laughs> in the desert as well. But. Well, we get, to want, we get to see launches out at Vandenberg, California, and uh, it's a little drier out there. It still is on the coast, so we have some humidity. But uh, it is quite a sight. It's a definite pro tip. I, I didn't know that. I've been, oh, well, <laughs> I've been in the office for five years. Uh, no, no one taught me that. Told so. an astronaut something. Yeah. No, I'm feeling proud. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what. You haven't learned nearly as much as I've learned in my time uh, being in these two uh, launch attempts. And so happy you could come back and count this down. We know our astronauts all around the country are watching. Checked in with Megan MacArthur earlier. Had a nice little chat with her. She's watching. Other astronauts from the core. The astronaut core is roughly, what, about 42 astronauts? Yep, about that, yep. And then a, a new class called, the, they're named the Flies, the 2021 the class. The Flies, they, about, that's about their name? halfway through their training, yep. And looking okay. forward to, they're cr crushing it as you would expect. Started. And there's the call from the core. Yeah, here we go. So at this point, <coughs> you know, all the closeout crew is not only off the tower, but outside what's called the exclusion zone or the hazard area, or the different words for it. Basically, the, the radius away from the launch pad uh, since there's now prop flowing into the rocket. Well, T-minus 34 minutes and counting until liftoff. Today we will begin the next six-month rotation mission to the International Space Station. As we've been documenting, we heard the launch escape system armed happened just before that propellant load began. Dragon capsule, it was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer for the fuel. SpaceX uses monomethyl hydrazine, or what they call MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for oxidizer. And together, these propellants feed those Draco engines that will maneuver Dragon on orbit it also feeds those eight Super Draco engines you were talking about that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And so with that fueling having begun, that means those eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready. We heard, or rather Raja, relayed that the astronauts can hear those valves turning, getting that system ready to go 
should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. Of course, NASA and SpaceX teams, they train extensively for exactly that type of contingency. And so with T-minus 33 minutes and counting, let's head back over to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California for an operations update from Kate Tice. Kate. Thanks, Daryl. I continue to follow along with the final minutes of the launch countdown, heading for on-time launch just under 33 minutes from now. Everything's still looking good for Dragon and Falcon 9. No major issues reported by the teams at this time. As we heard on the loops, the launch escape system is now armed and Falcon 9 propellant loading uh, began at T minus 35 minutes. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is oxidizer loaded into a tank at the top of each stage. The other, a fuel loaded into a tank at the bottom of each stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is RP-1, which is a refined kerosene. The oxidizer loaded on each stage is densified liquid oxygen or LOX. Densified means it is kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles and takes up less volume, which allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. And as Raja mentioned minutes ago, you can tell how full the tanks are based on how high the condensation appears on the outside of the vehicle. To ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use the ignition fluids of triethyl aluminum and triethyl boron, also called TTEB. When TTEB comes into contact with oxygen, it burns and produces a green colored flame. Once we have the flame going, we add the kerosene fuel into the Merlin chamber and the engine ramps up to full power. You might see the green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation two minutes and 48 seconds into flight. Now, for those of you who have been following along, you'll know that we stood down from our initial launch attempt of Crew-6 on February 26th due to a TTEB ground system issue. It was determined to be the result of a clogged ground system filter that was impeding the flow of TTEB. SpaceX teams replaced the filter, purged the TTEB line with nitrogen, and verified the lines are ready for launch. Lastly, we're topping, helium, uh, off, we're topping off helium into pressure vessels on both, the, on both stages. Um, that is actually used to pressurize the tanks in flight as the propellant is pulled out and consumed by the Merlin engines. Um, it's very similar to when you're drinking from a plastic Stage water bottle. Helium loading has started. And there's that call for that cryo helium load I was just talking about. Um, it's similar to drinking out of a plastic water bottle. You gotta let some air back into the bottle to keep it from crumpling. Now on board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring the systems while propellants are loaded into the Falcon 9 below them, as you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. The crew's training in the simulator here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, actually included playback of sounds recorded in Dragon capsules uh, during recent flights. So all of the sounds that they're hearing now, um, not only did they hear before in our previous launch attempt, but they heard it uh, during the training simulations as well. As for the range, they continue to report no problems and they are go to support launch. Weather also looks great. Uh, as I mentioned before, our probability of violation uh, for the launch constraints uh, is only 5%, so really good on that front. As a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, uh, we will have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity tomorrow, just under 24 hours from tonight's planned launch. At this point in time, at just under T minus 29 and a half minutes, I'll turn it back over to Jesse and Gary for an overview of events that we'll see after liftoff. Awesome, thanks, Kate. For crew six, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 24 and a half hours. And as we wait for that T zero mark coming up in just about 29 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a system series of system checks to make sure that both the Dragon and the Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're going to be looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. Now, as we wait for that launch clock to hit zero, we wanted to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of that mission is going to look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9 engines will throttle down to ha help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. 
It's worth noting that once we hit that max Q point, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth from landing, as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event, SES-1, or second stage engine start number one, where the MVAC engine lights up and propel propels the second stage, along with our Crew-6 astronauts, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down home on Earth. The first is the entry burn. That's where three of the M1D engines will reignite and then shut down again. Now this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And while the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for a confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, but it's powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on our drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while the Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it'll begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. It's worth noting that these are not the super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over the next 24-ish hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases. Undergo undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way to station. All of that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Courtney in Mission Control Houston. Courtney. Thanks, Gary. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, ensuring it is ready to receive Crew Dragon. They're also making sure communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly, and the consensus to this point is that everything is proceeding right on track. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft on Friday. They'll perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches on both the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for welcoming remarks for the new crew members. From there on out, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 6, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station until their return back to Earth. Here in Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Judd Freeling is on console overseeing the team for launch. And that's it from here in Mission Control Houston, so I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? We're looking great out here, Courtney, and thank you very much as we cruise around the set here. Our production team doing a great job showing us all the sights and the sounds of the countdown of Crew 6. Liftoff is at 12.34 a.m. Eastern Time, and if you're just joining us, well, we're doing well. Having a great countdown, 24 minutes to go for the sixth astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Commander Stephen Bowen, Pilot Woody Hoberg, and Mission Specialist Sultan Alniadi and Andrei Fedyev are strapped into the seats, as you can see them here inside Dragon Endeavor. The Falcon 9 rocket fueling operation well underway. The launch escape system is armed. That means Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations looking and sounding as we would expect. 
And you can see on the rocket, we're filling her up. The condensation of the warm, humid Florida air down there shows you that, uh, well, my guess would be about a third, <laughs> but uh, I have no actual <laughs> uh, telemetry to tell me that. Just going by uh, the condensation coming off the rocket. It really super chills the skin on the outside of the rocket, and then that, uh, that uh, you know, condenses the air in the atmosphere, the water that's in the air. And it really is something to look at once it's ready to go, all the way up and down the rocket. And, and the reason we make it, they make it super cold is that, uh, you know, if there's probably, let's see, third or fourth graders out there, I know that's what my kids are learning about, it's like when something's really cold, it gets dense, so you can get more of it in there. So that's why it's important. You Every drop of gas matters when you're trying to get to orbit. Every You want as much margin. John was talking before about uh, why we build the timelines we do, and so, you know we always hope everything goes nominally, but we train for all kinds of contingencies. And so, um, you know, we've been talking about launch launch escapes, but the the next phase is rendezvousing with the space station. And so we protect for you know a problem with either the station or the capsule and having to you know back away and come back again in 24 hours. And so all that requires prop and gas and the further and higher the F9 can get the Dragon, the more options we have. So that's why that's why they chill the gas. You heard calls earlier about the cryohelium, um, and like they talked about it uh, out at Hawthorne, that means that, that we have enough gas to pressurize the tanks. Uh, and then next you'll start tearing probably in about another minute, they'll start talking about uh, stage two fuel being loaded. And so you'll hear calls, uh, you'll talk, hear them talk about stage two and stage one, it's a two-stage rocket. So there's fuel and oxidizer for both the stages. Um, the first stage, like they described, having the nine engines and the, the second stage having one, but both of those require, have separate tanks for the fuel and oxidizer. And they'll, you'll hear them calling those out. Because again, the crew um, probably can't as much hear it like the same way they hear the Super Draco valves, but you can hear uh, sort of some creaking and some noises uh, some definitely some vibrations. So getting a call before that happens just kind of reassures them that that sound is expected and gives them a reference point on the time that they're following. We're about 37 seconds away from completing stage two RP1 load. In the meantime, let's tell you about the crew. The commander of crew six is Captain Stephen G. Bowen. He hails from Cohasset, Massachusetts. Married with three children, holds the title of first U.S. Navy submarine officer to be selected as a mission specialist by NASA. Captain Bowen is also a veteran of NASA space flights, including the space shuttle flights on STS-126, 132, and 133, the only astronaut to ever go consecutive back-to-back -back shuttles. Sitting next to Stephen is pilot Warren Woody Hoburn, the 37-year-old from Pittsburgh. He studied aeronautics and astronautics from MIT before getting a doctorate in electrical engineering and a computer science a degree from the University of California, Berkeley. During grad school, Hoberg worked as an EMT with the Yosemite Yer Search and Rescue. Crew 6 will be Hoberg. Stage Hoberg's. 2, RP-1 load complete. And there's that load complete. Stage 2 is in the books. We'll load it up. And now you can see the venting off of that uh, liquid oxygen. Talking about Hoberg, this flight will be his first flight since NASA selected him to be an astronaut along with Rajachari's class in 2017, the Turtles. In the role of mission specialist is astronaut Sultan al Niyadi. He was chosen by the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates to be a part of Expeditions 6869. Father of five spent most of his life in Al Ain and Abu Dhabi, but in 2020 traded that in for astronaut training in Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. This will be his first trip to space space. And it's also the first trip for second mission specialist, Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Fedyev. He will be working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He will be a flight engineer for Expedition 68, just turned 42 years of age. Each of these four crew members will be part of Expedition 68 once they arrive at the International Space Station. T minus 18 minutes and counting. We had strong back chill that began. And coming up in just a few minutes, we'll start loading liquid oxygen onto the second stage. And I think a, a great testament to the international partnerships of this program. Half the crew is you know, international. 
Sultan being the first uh, UAE astronaut to launch on a U.S. vehicle from the U.S. to have trained at Johnson Space Center. Um, an amazing, uh, you know, completion of the partnership that started several years ago, and taking that now all the way to completion, um, and just great to see, you know, NASA and space exploration being just this great unifier uh, for the world, uh, especially as you know, there's low Earth orbit, but then we look beyond that to Artemis and, and Mars, and just the the collaboration and the work to do such hard things and really pulling together the best of, of all our all the nations. And the partnership of those nations rises above all else. And That's, it's, yeah. uh, it's impressive, the camaraderie of the crews in space with their international backgrounds. So that venting, so we talked about there's two things happening. In the Dragon case. SpaceX, F9 is proceeding with prop load and we're tracking no issues with Dragon or F9 going into launch. SpaceX Dragon copies. So an update from the core that's on track. So we talked about the condensation a few times, and there's also the venting, so two different processes. The condensation is the super chilled fuel cooling the, the metal and the skin around it. The venting is because it's super cold as it heats up on the inside, just from the air temperature, you know, essentially working its way in there, it vents. And so that's just like a pot boiling, um, and just like you would, you know, lift the lid off a tea kettle to let the pressure out. Uh, this is the same thing you're seeing happen there. So that's what's happening kind of from the middle of the screen. Yeah, and, and on a calm night like tonight, the winds have totally died down. You can see it as it cascades down like a waterfall coming off uh, the middle of uh, the strong back there. Want to make a quick note about the, the radio and how you can hear if you're on uh, local amateur radio on the VHF radio frequency, turn into 146.940 megahertz and UHF radio frequency 444.925 megahertz on the FM mode. You can hear this all around HD the space coast. load has started. And there goes our stage two locks load. On a beautiful night on the coast of central Florida. For stage one, that's going to continue to load and we'll see that go all the way down to T minus six minutes in terms of uh, the RP1 load, in terms of locks, that will continue until about T minus three to two minutes on the liquid oxygen side. A lot more volume, of course, in the first stage. Hey, let's throw up a quick social media question. What do you say, Raj? Sounds good. What do we got here? At JSE Garen asks, oh, I am nine years old and want to know if you can see airplanes on the ISS. I have never heard that question. So actually, uh, Megan uh, MacArthur had a cool post where she took a picture of the ground and you can see the contrails of a plane. So you can't see a plane if it's not what we call conning, meaning contrails. You can, if you can find the contrails, then you can follow it back to find the plane, but it's super hard to find an actual airplane that's not in the contrails. Um, we also spent some time on Crew 3 trying to see who could one-up each other to find ships. Uh, so you can cheat and look around the Panama Canal uh, to see if you could find ships there, but <laughs> you, you need binoculars to help yourself. But if you know where to look uh, or along the shipping lanes, you can usually find some from ships. And then airplanes, if you look around, uh, like the places like over the Atlantic where you can look for contrails and find planes, but absolutely you can see them. What a great answer. Didn't know that. Thank you, Raj. Let's head out to Kate Tice now. Thanks, Daryl. Everything's still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon Endeavor just under 15 minutes from now. Now, for those just tuning in, Falcon 9 began propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Around T minus 20 minutes, Falcon 9 completed loading of RP1 fuel on the second stage. Fuel loading on the first stage remains underway. Um, and it is approximately 80% uh, full. Um, it will finish around T minus six minutes. Falcon 9 is also underway with loading of densified liquid oxygen. Uh, and that will wrap up at T minus three minutes uh, for the first stage and T minus two minutes for the second stage. Coming up, we'll perform checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, a procedure called TVC wiggles. We'll command Falcon 9 to activate those thrust vector controllers and actually wiggle the engines a couple degrees. This verifies that those engines will be able to move while in flight, which is how Falcon 9 steers itself during the ascent phase. Dragon mission director and team reporting no issues. Communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted and the launch escape system is armed. And as you can see there, 
uh, on the right hand side of your screen, the crew is strapped in and ready to go to space. Everybody looks pretty calm and chill, uh, you know, given that they are going to space in uh, 13 minutes. <laughs> Final instructions to the crew will come at T minus 10 minutes. The crew displays will be configured for launch, which give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant updates on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes, we'll then be in terminal count and Dragon will transition to internal power. We'll hear continued status call outs from SpaceX mission control as we get closer to liftoff. The range is go, all secured air and sea space remain clear. And as you can see, weather, weather remains gorgeous uh, and everything still remains inbound for the launch criteria. So all in all, Falcon 9 and Dragon Endeavor, all systems remain go for launch in just 12 minutes and 34 seconds from now. All right, thank you very much, Kate. And take a look at this picture. Before their flight, Crew-6 got a picture with what was supposed to be their booster. Actually got swapped out for a brand new booster, but anytime you get that close to the hardware, it's a cool thing. Brand new booster launching tonight. And at the time Falcon 9 and Dragon launches, the International Space Station, which is being tracked right here by Mission Control, will be 260 statute miles over the Bristol Channel, southwest of Cardiff, Wales. Crew 6, once they get off the ground, will spend the next 25 hours chasing down the International Space Station for a rendezvous at 1.11 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. It'll be Friday. And we'll have live coverage on NASA TV of docking and the Crew 6 welcome ceremony at 11 p.m. Eastern Time tonight final right. thoughts raja yep so get ready to lift off yeah so right here they're uh at 10 minutes they'll probably say some thank yous to the ground uh, a lot of people got them here uh they're, you're gonna see them messing with the displays so woody and steve will be putting up what's called forward views on the outside displays so the mission specialists can monitor the parameters that's how they monitor anything that would uh how the performance is doing in the center display they'll bring up the event details uh that show the launch and you'll see them put their hands down once they get closer to launch and they'll have this display up so they can basically watch they'll have everything configured and that's what they talk about configuring for launch so that you don't have to touch it during the launch itself. Colonel Chari putting us in the seat of the astronauts with exactly what they're doing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And one more thing I want to say. I don't know, Raja. I have a feeling there's love in the air. Not going <laughs> to give it away, but it just feels like there's love in the air. You've got to stay tuned to find out more about that. For now, we'll turn it over to Gary and Kate at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Take us through the rest of the countdown. Thanks, Daryl. That's right. We're exactly t minus 10 and a half minutes until liftoff of Crew 6. Uh, as you can see there on your screen, Falcon 9 is underway with propellant loading, as indicated uh, by those white clouds forming around the vehicle. Uh, the fuel loading is complete on the second stage. LOX load remains underway. It's about 40% full on the second stage. Locks load also underway. Dragon, SpaceX confirm crew displays configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon crew displays are configured for launch. Copy that, Steve. And once again, on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we're honored to have you aboard Dragon Capsule Endeavor on its next trip to the International Space Station. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And thanks again to everyone out there who made the vehicle, the ISS, our mission, and our crew ready for launch. Really want to thank everyone and appreciate the uh, great call, much appreciated call for the scrub the other night. Uh, it was a great uh, call and a good learning opportunity for the crew and I think for the teams. And uh, so once more to the breach, dear friends, Crew 6 is ready to launch. Some nice words there between the crew, as you see there on your screen, and SpaceX Core, uh, located here at SpaceX Mission Control, which a lot of you uh, there on your screen, as you can tell by perhaps the, the ambient noise around me, the energy is starting to grow uh, in anticipation for launch, coming up about eight and a half minutes from now. That's right, the energy is high here, Kate. 
Now at that T-minus 10 minute mark, we heard the good luck and God speed from the teams here in Mission Control in Hawthorne where that crowd is gathering. Meanwhile, we're tracking the loading of fuel and oxidizer on the first and second stage. Second stage filled with fuel right now, continuing to fill with oxidizer. It'll be the last of the tanks to fill. Stage one continuing to be underway. At the 10 minute mark, you heard that call for configuring the uh, crew displays for launch. That was confirmed. At the T minus 10 minute mark, it also is a point where Falcon 9 launch commit criteria gets checked by the computers past that milestone. Now we're counting down to the next milestone at T minus seven minutes, which is setting up for engine chill. That's right, we should hear that call out in about 44 seconds. Um, at T minus seven minutes, we will actually open up um, the pre-valves to the M1D engines, those nine engines at the base of the first stage. Um, that will allow a little bit of that super chilled, densified liquid oxygen to flow into the hardware, that those turbo pumps. And that basically helps prepare the hardware from a thermal standpoint or a temperature standpoint uh, for that full flow of super chilled liquid oxygen. So um, we basically open up the pre-valves and a little bit of that LOX flows in and helps cool the hardware down in preparation for a full flow of liquid oxygen. Engine chill has started. And as expected, there's that call out for that engine chill, indicating the pre-valves are open and the engines are beginning to prepare for liftoff. Now under six minutes, 45 seconds from launch, again, we're continuing to fuel the Falcon 9 rocket, stage two filled with the RP-1 kerosene. At the T minus six minute mark, we should hear a call out that the stage one RP load is complete. They're just topping that off. Liquid oxygen on both the first and second stages stage come next. RP-1 load complete. And there's that confirmation. We're counting down to T minus five minutes at this point. At T minus, at T minus five, the, dr the dragon continue is configured for terminal count. And at terminal count, Dragon is switched to internal power, right now receiving power from umbilical lines from the ground. Also at uh, just under five minutes, we'll be waiting for strong back retract. The arm that's currently propping the Falcon 9 and Dragon up, we'll see the clamp arm start to open and the strong back itself will tilt about two degrees off from where it is now at a 90 degree position. Just a little off, and then it'll get out of the way completely upon liftoff. Then of course comes the, uh, after the strong back retracts comes the completion of liquid oxygen uh, loading on both the first and second stage. For now, T minus five minutes, 15 seconds, we're going to stand by for that call of configuring for terminal count. Crew six in their seated positions and ready for launch. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. Tanks are pressurizing for strong bay recheck. All right, and we heard both of those calls. Dragon onboard computers are going to take control of the vehicle. We should be seeing the clamp arm at the very top of the second stage, right underneath where you see the unpressurized trunk of Dragon, which is indicated by the half black and half white indicators, the black being the solar panels that provide power to the Dragon is on its transit to the International Space Station. Now that confirmation of strong back retract, we should be able to visually see that strong back. Strong back will retract about two degrees away from the vehicle. Then at liftoff, the strong back will actually go back to 45 degrees. That strong back is part of the transporter erector, which provides uh, the liquids and gases and uh, electrical connections to the vehicle. As Gary pointed out, those clamp arms opened up underneath the trunk, just above the first stage. And you can see that action happening now as 
that initial retraction just a couple degrees away from the vehicle. At this point in time, fueling remains underway, excuse me, propellant load remains underway. All fuels are loaded, that RP-1 um, liquid oxygen load should... H-1, lock flow complete. There, we just heard that call out that that is all done. Second stage, lock load still underway. That will wrap up at about T minus two minutes. Now that that first stage liquid oxygen uh, load is complete. We'll see um, some more of that white gaseous cloud forming around the vehicle uh, due to those lines being Dragon closed off. Dragon is in off. terminal count and on internal power. All right, good call out there indicating that Dragon is running on its own power. We are in the terminal count now at T minus two minutes and 29 seconds. The crew remains comfortable there on the right-hand side of your screen. About 15 seconds remaining in stage two locks load. Stage two, lock flow complete. Okay. Dragon is in auto idle. You heard those calls. The Falcon 9 fully fueled with RP-1 rocket fuel as well as the liquid oxygen. That call of Dragon is in auto idle. There's going to be a series gas of calls. Gas started. Expect lagging. There's the gas closeout purging the lines of the fuel that has supplied the Falcon 9 with RP-1 and liquid oxygen. We'll also wait for a call of the arming of the flight termination system. The Dragon flight computers are configured for launch. Flight termination system will allow Falcon 9 to talk to Dragon on the ride uphill. Terminate the flight, Falcon issuing an abort. Startup. Dragon is in countdown. T minus one minute and counting. Dragon is in countdown. Everything's looking good for launch. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX, Dragon, copy, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30 seconds and counting. All teams pulled, go. Fifteen seconds. Ready for an on-time launch for the instantaneous one. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Engines full power and lift off. The crew six. Go dragon. Go Falcon. Vehicles pitching down range, 1.7 million pounds of thrust provided by the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage. Hearing good call, stage one propulsion is nominal. We're now at T plus 34 seconds into the sixth rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Power and telemetry nominal. Stage one throttle down. So there we have heard the call out indicating that the first stage engines will begin to throttle down in preparation for max Q, which is the moment of maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will experience during flight. Vehicle is supersonic. That call out there indicating the vehicle's traveling faster than the speed of sound. Max Q. Stage one throttle up. All right, now that we're past max Q. One Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. That one Bravo indicator are different abort modes that are called 
that allow the ground teams and the crew to track about the position of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon as they make their way up the eastern seaboard. In the event of an abort, these different abort modes would indicate about the position where Dragon would land, started. as well as uh, indicate what series of maneuvers Dragon would indicate. But so far, we're hearing good calls on the performance of the Falcon 9 on its ride uphill. One minute, 53 seconds into flight. We're about 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff which will be followed quickly by stage separation and second engine start, which is the ignition of that MVAC engine on the second stage. Now about 10 seconds away from main engine cutoff. Two Copy, Stage two alpha. separation confirmed. There you can see on your screen confirmation of stage separation as well as ignition of that second stage engine. Second stage is now carrying the Crew-6 astronauts to orbit. Beautiful view there on the left-hand side of your screen coming from the first stage which as you can see is still gaining an altitude. It has not yet uh, reached its apogee, a beautiful view of the Florida Space Coast there in the background. Meanwhile, we're tracking good performance on that MVAC engine. On the screen to your right, we'll be hearing periodic performance calls about once every minute of the status of the trajectory of the second stage and the Crew-6 astronauts that are inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. We'll also be Position hearing call outs, Bermuda. just like you heard just there as we pass over the various ground stations along the ascent track. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. And there's that performance call out. Dragon acknowledges nominal trajectory. As Hearing. for the first stage there on the left-hand side of your screen, that first stage still gaining an altitude, although um, that gain is slowing down. Um, it will be making its way back down to Earth, landing, uh, attempting a landing on our drone ship. Just read the instructions, which is located um, off the Florida coast by a couple hundred miles. The MVAC engine on stage two burns for six minutes after second stage ignition. We'll continue to see this engine burn until about eight and a half minutes into today's flight. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. SpaceX, Dragon, nominal trajectory. Again, these performance calls happen once a minute Flight team's continuing to track the Falcon 9 and its ascent. Everything's looking good so far. You'll also continue to hear those check-ins of the ground stations as we pass them. At this point in time, we're roughly two minutes away from the next major event, which will be the entry burn for the first stage. We will relight three engines, uh, three M1D engines on that first stage to help slow the vehicle down uh, as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. We're approaching 200 kilometers in altitude. It's about 124 miles. Meanwhile, velocity. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Good trajectory calls. About to pass 12,000 kilometers per hour. Dragon, nominal trajectory. It's about 7,500 miles per hour. Everything looking nominal for both first and second stages. 
now coming up to T plus six and a half minutes into flight. Mostly what we're hearing now are the performance calls in the second stage. In about a minute is when we'll see uh, a series of events in rapid succession. It's been a pretty good pace since second stage ignition. Uh, about a, uh, less than a minute from now, we'll start to see Dragon, more action SpaceX. on the first stage. Phenomenal trajectory. SpaceX Dragon, phenomenal trajectory. As Gary mentioned, those callouts occurring about once every minute. Now we're about 20 seconds away from the first stage entry burn. That burn will last about 30 seconds and help slow the vehicle down as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. Stage one entry burn startup. And there you can see- Stage two, FTS has saved. On your screen, that first stage entry burn has begun. That booster sees high drag, which actually scrubs roughly 70% of the velocity by the time that the landing burn begins. So about another 10 seconds of this entry burn. Again, three engines relit, the center and two Stage radio engines. Burn, and conclusion of that entry burn. Meanwhile, good performance on the second stage. Since second stage ignition, we've been in a two alpha abort mode. The next abort modes will happen in rapid succession to Bravo, to Charlie, Delta, Terminal and Echo. Guidance. Each indicating different series of maneuvers in the event of an abort scenario. But as you've been hearing through the periodic checks, we're seeing good trajectory, good performance on the Dragon and Falcon 9. Seco, second stage engine cutoff, would be coming at eight minutes, 48 seconds. We're coming up on that event. SpaceX Dragon Shannon. Shannon. Copy, Shannon. Now off the coast of Shannon, Ireland. Standing by for Seco. MVAC shut down. Stage one landing burn. And there we heard the call out indicating that landing burn. Dragon, SpaceX, we have a nominal orbit insertion. Great news there for. SpaceX Dragon copies nominal orbital insertion. Launch escape system disarmed. For Dragon Endeavor. Stage one landing lead deploy. Attempting to land on our drone ship, just read the instructions. There you can see on your screen, and also indicated by the cheers behind me, successful landing of this booster. It's first trip to space, and therefore it's first landing. An eruption of applause here at SpaceX Mission Control. And of course, after second stage engine cutoff, you heard that call that the crew is in orbit. They're now in a coast phase, where the second stage remains idle. Uh, for about three minutes before Dragon separates from the second stage. Meanwhile, you can see that first stage in the legs right on target. We're now getting views from the second stage. You can see this is one of the cameras that's pointing up into the trunk of Dragon. Of course, we're continuing to get views of the expansion nozzle at the end of the MVAC engine. But the crew is in orbit. Falcon 9 has almost done its job. It completed its job uh, with propelling the astronauts through the six minutes of the second stage and, of course, the more than two and a half minutes of the first stage. Continuing in this coast period. We're heading to about the 12 minute mark after launch. So we're approaching 11 minutes right now. But it's great to see the crew in orbit. Uh, of course, we are waiting for that step separation. You can see this view right here of the MVAC engine, the second stage really in just an idle position, really just coasting, not many commands being issued from the Falcon 9. But of course, at the very end, we'll actually issue the command for separating the Dragon from the Falcon 9. 
you'll see a series, you may see a series of burns. The Draco engines uh, on the service section of the Draco will fire and uh, increase uh, separation distance from the second stage. Once again, live view there from the second stage, looking up into the trunk, which of course is the unpressurized section um, that goes along with the Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. That's where we are able to store uh, basically cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space. So a great view there looking up into the trunk. That will be hopefully the first views that we get um, of that separation event, which we're expecting here uh, any second. There you can see on your screen confirmation. Dragon separation confirmed. Of that separation confirmed. Dragon Endeavor is now floating free in space. That's right, the Falcon Dragon. 9. CE here. Welcome to orbit. Congratulations. Your flight is exactly four years after the flight of the Demo 1 mission. Like Andre said, all the best things take two tries. Happy that we could get you off tonight. Uh, if you enjoyed your ride, please don't forget to give us five stars. Over to LD for some words. Also, a friendly reminder to put your sushi orders in for CRS 27. Have a safe ride to the space station, and we look forward to seeing you when you get home. Thank you for flying SpaceX. I could lost the signal, Bermuda. And SpaceX Dragon copies all. That was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Cru the Crew 6 astronauts, of course, uh, having a strong bond. And SpaceX Dragon, we'd like to really for the great ride to orbit today. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. It may have taken two rides, but it's two times, but it's worth the trip. And uh, I guess I'll pass it over to Woody for some words. Yeah, SpaceX Dragon, just want to say as a rookie flyer, that was one heck of a ride. Thank you. But I would say put it as an absolute miracle of engineering, and I just feel so lucky that I get to fly on this amazing machine. Thanks to SpaceX, thanks to NASA, commercial crew program, and our international partners. Um, a lot of innovation went into this, tireless work effort, and a lot of pain painstaking attention to detail and focus on testing. And I think that's what makes it all possible to fly humans in space. Thank you. Some really nice words. Помогали в этом деле мне и всем ребятам. И я хочу сказать, что, что сегодня человечество делает еще один шаг в подготовке к новому большому скачку. И для меня огромная честь быть частью такой большой и дружной семьи, и величайшей международной команды, как Международной космической станции, работая вместе на благо всего человечества. Today, humanity takes another step. For next big leap, and for me, a huge honor to be part of such a big and friendly family and the greatest international team of the ISS, working together for all mankind. Thank you. Well said, everybody. Uh, allow me to say a few words in Arabic first. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وصلنا الفضاء بس بغيت أشكر أمي وابوي وأشكر عائلتي شكرا القيادة الرشيدة وشكرا لمركز محمد بن راشد للفضاء اللي يعطوني الثقة هذه وكذلك أشكر كل من جهزنا ودربنا لهذه اللحظة التاريخية من مختلف وكالات الفضاء في أنحاء العالم شكرا لكم جزيلا شكرا سبيسيك لإيصالنا الفضاء I would like to say thank you to, for everybody thanks to my parents my family thanks to our leadership the Mohammed Barash Space Center for their trust thank you for everybody who trained us and got us ready for this mission this is incredible launch was incredible amazing 
Thank you so much. And last but not least, thank you, NASA. Thank you, SpaceX, for flying us to space. Go Dragon, go SpaceX. And allow me to introduce our fifth crew member. His name is Suhail, and Suhail is the Arabic name for the star Canobus. And in the Middle East, we anticipate the appearance of Canobus because it marks the end of summer and the beginning of cool time. And Canobus is actually the second brightest star in the night sky. And this is the second flight for uh, Suhail because he flew with uh, astronaut Hazar Mansouri in 2019. And many people think Suhail is uh, an, al an alien, but to me, on Earth in a spacesuit, but with high ambitions. Thank you once again, and talk to you from the ISS. And Dragon SpaceX, we copy all those words. Uh, at this time, I can provide you an update that uh, we had nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Uh, for your awareness, uh, on hard capture hook five, we did swap to backup motors. So you'll see that the uh, nose cone opening did swap to backup. However, all hooks did indicate that they were traveling and look good on backup. Acquisition signal. copies, and we see that on the display. All right. Very dynamic time. Um, of course, the Falcon 9 delivering the Crew-6 astronauts into orbit after the nine-minute ascent. We heard those great congratulatory words from each and every member of Crew-6, who, of course, had a strong bond with the teams here in uh, Mission Control and SpaceX. Uh, that call you did here to the crew was about the nose cone. Uh, the nose cone is deploying now. They were troubleshooting an issue with one of the hooks, but switched to backup motors, and we're seeing that nose cone deploy now. Uh, but Crew-6 is now on its way to the International Space Station. It's going to take about 24 and a half hours. So they'll go through a series of checks, a series of initial burns, and then eventually have a sleep period before waking up and really getting into the action uh, with a lot of the burns that bring it closer and closer to the International Space Station. It'll be docking to the Zenith port. We're now getting views from the Dragon, and that's the nose cone deploying that you're seeing right now on the end of the dragon. And Kate, this really sets the uh, crew up for some of the major burns here. That nose cone deploying reveals the four forward bulkhead Dracos that do a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of those significant burns that bring the crew closer to the International Space Station. That's right. The nose cone is basically the pointy end at the top of Dragon. So now with that being exposed, those forward bulkhead thrusters uh, will be able to do their job um, as Dragon Endeavor makes its way to the International Space Station. Um, just prior to losing the ground station coverage, we were able to catch a quick glimpse of the zero-G indicator. Um, I always love seeing that be revealed uh, as it's always different for each crew and it's always special to the crew members. Um, so I love the words that were shared around that. And I personally have a strong connection to this capsule. This was the Demo 2 capsule, the Crew 2 capsule, the Axiom 1 capsule, and now the Crew 6 capsule. And so um, it always brings a, a lot of uh, pride and joy to see this particular capsule fly in space safely once again. So with all that being said, let's head back over to Daryl and Raja, who saw all of the, the, the liftoff action live. You guys, I bet it was incredible having seen it from the press site myself a couple of times. I know you can feel it. Tell us how it was to see this crew lift off. Absolutely, Kate, and uh, thank you for the toss back here to the Kennedy Space Center. And on that point, we got to get Raja's reaction first because it was his first launch. He's, he's been on a <laughs> rocket 
He's been to space. Let's we'll see the outside. First time watching a long. Yeah, that, that was awesome, Daryl. Uh, it was uh, better than I expected. So I think uh, much uh, a much more throaty, rumbling sound once it started to pitch over. Uh, and a beautiful night here, so we could see the second stage light. We could actually see the throttle down for uh, from stage one to stage B, which was really cool. Uh, saw the separation. Saw the light go out when the first stage separated. Saw the second stage light and got to watch it. Uh, all, pretty much all the way to two Bravo. It was it was pretty impressive. To so two that, Bravo. Yeah. What, 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 Sorry, those are those are different launch escape phases. So yeah, it was uh, it was awesome seeing it from the ground and just kind of thinking through what that ride was like a while ago. But uh, I'd, ra I'd rather be on the inside, than the outside. <laughs> but it's pretty. In here with us. <laughs> but it's pretty it's pretty impressive uh, from both views. Yeah, it was, well, it we're was so cool glad to see them. And exciting. That, yeah, you. exciting that they're on the way to the space station. I'm so um, happy for them. No doubt. Congratulations to not only the crew that is getting up into space, but also everyone who helped make it possible. It takes an, an, a tremendous number of people in order to pull that off. And that roar, right? When did you feel it in your chest? Yeah. So on the the day of the, you can yeah here it, it, you can feel it there and you can feel it here. You'd actually feel the vibration. They can actually bodily, you know, it's actually vibrating your body, Visceral, the, the, the yeah. ground around you. And I think just the coolness of it, almost it's almost daytime around the launch pad when it first lit. Just with the humidity, uh, the temperature dew point spread right now. There's a lot of moisture in the air, so just the reflection of the light. You actually couldn't even see the top of the rocket. It was the flame, the the plume lit up the whole horizon. So basically, as far as you could see, 180 degrees here just looked like daylight for the first about 20 seconds. So it was really, really cool. Well, your first launch, watching. Yep, I'll be back Sir? again. Yeah, we're ready to see another one. <laughs> we love it. Fantastic. All right, um, as I mentioned before, we got to the you know terminal count and ascent. I said there was a little bit of love in the air, right? Well, why is that? Well, a gentleman by the name of Sabi Farouk brought his girlfriend to the Banana Creek launch viewing location and proposed to her right at liftoff. They're both from Denver. We have a picture, and there it is. There's Sabi and his girlfriend. Now fiance. And now fiance, yeah. Tamori. And she's sporting the ring. Congratulations to them. What a, what a special thing to do. He had planned out this because during their, uh, when they first met, they had their first kiss at a rocket launch, and so he wanted to bring <laughs> her back to propose, and it happened right here at the NASA Kennedy Space Center. What a neat love That's story, cool, huh? Yeah, what a great story, yeah. Congratulations to both of them. And so now, let's turn it over to Jasmine, who is with a special guest with some post-launch reaction. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Daryl. Here on the balcony of OSB2, we had a great view of launch and the crowd around us just erupted in cheers. It lit up the night sky. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center Deputy Center Director Kelvin Manning. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it's great to be here, Jasmine. We are so glad to have you. And Kelvin, first question is easy. What did you think of launch? It was spectacular. And <laughs> anytime we're putting people on a rocket makes it even more special. So. We launched satellites, we launched all kinds of things, but tonight it was Steve, Woody, Sultan, and Andre, um, watching them walk out, saying goodbye to their families, and uh, for us to get them off safely onto the International Space Station, that's a huge accomplishment. It really is a huge accomplishment. Daryl just mentioned love in the air, and we saw that great proposal at uh, Banana Creek, and Commercial Crew is really the perfect marriage of our commercial and our international partners. Isn't that right, Kelvin? Absolutely. So government, industry, and, and international partners, it's kind of like a modern day, what we strive to have like Star Trek. You have all these people from different planets and uh, we're just getting started here. So maybe one day we'll have uh, people from other planets as well. <laughs> We really are just kicking things off. And you mentioned, you know, the, the astronauts flying on today's mission and that you've actually uh, been on the selection panel for a few of the astronaut classes before. One of those was the turtles. So pretty exciting for you to get to see uh, Woody fly today, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, special guy and uh, really looking forward to seeing him on orbit and then getting him back home and, and hearing his stories. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to having him back as well as uh, the rest of Crew 6. And this was really a great way to kick off the launches of 2023. We mentioned earlier with Janet Petro that we are looking at over 90 launches this year. So what else is going to station in the next few months? Okay, we got a cargo resupply mission, CRS-27. We have uh, Boeing's inaugural flight of the uh, crew flight tests, uh, looking for Sonny and Butch. To sometime this spring 
to fly the CST-100 Starliner to station. That's a huge deal. And we got uh, another commercial uh, Axiom mission that'll go to the, the space station. And then we'll look at Crew-7 to follow these guys in another six months or so. Wow, a lot of work going on here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Kelvin, any final words of thanks that you want to give to the workforce here? Yeah, it's all about the team. And this is America's space program. You talked about our industry partners, our other government partners, and our international partners. Uh, we have a lot to be proud of. And like we said, we're just getting started. So thank you, Jasmine. Of course, and this really is the dream team. We appreciate you being here tonight, Kelvin. Okay, all right, thank you. Daryl, back to you. Thank you so much, Jasmine, and you see her working the love in there with the CCP. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. Well, the crew is on the way to the International Space Station. We did hear uh, from the SpaceX team that the nose cone hooks at the top of the spacecraft, right, yep. the Dragon, um, they went to the backup motors in order to release that nose cone. That's pretty critical to make sure you get that up. Great redundancy with the system there. But well, why is that so important that that nose cone comes off? Yeah, so we you can't dock to the space station without the nose cone. So the as we saw, just looking at the views of the capsule before uh, liftoff, it's closed for aerodynamics because you don't want a uh, door wide open while, you, while you're flying through the air. Once you're in space, of course, there's no drag, so then you can open that up. Um, and uh, that exposes the camera and the sensors that allow the Dragon to dock with the International Space Station. There's a whole lot of stuff going on, so the crew was working the comms back down to the ground and monitoring a whole bunch of systems, so we saw the separation. Uh, they have telemetry that gives them information about that, and then uh, the next step is the nose cone deploy, and as you heard the core mention, all of those hooks, uh, there's a dozen hooks, uh, six of them uh, are holding the nose cone, there's, and then basically each of those hooks has backup and primary motors, so what you heard them describe is one of those went onto the backup motor to open the hook, which is why we have backup motors. Uh, now with the nose cone open, they should be good to continue to the uh, the space station. Um, and next thing they'll be talking about is, is phasing burn, so we, you know, how they have to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there'll be teams looking at uh, the data from that to see if it was, kind of like we talked about earlier in the broadcast, was it actually a problem with the primary motor or was it just a bad telemetry? Uh, so the ground has some ability to, to suss that out with some extra data they have. They can try resetting things. So my guess is when they go to actually docking they may retry that primary motor just to see if it's working and then they have the backup oh. motor still as a, an option um, so they still have the redundancy but uh, they'll sort through uh, maybe troubleshooting that some more but I don't think it should affect the, the follow-on. So those on. hooks are used when they dock? Right the same yeah the same hooks uh, there's Mechanism. a soft capture and a hard capture mm -hmm. a hard hook system that uh, attaches them to the space station but again as long as the backup motor is working it should be fine. Should be good to go? Yep. All right well we will track it all along the way and we know we saw a visual confirmation of the nose cone coming off yep. saw that right on the video with the cameras that SpaceX has. And so now, Stephen, Woody, Sultan, and Andre are on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 1.17 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And of course, NASA TV will be wrapping up our coverage, but you can follow along with Crew-6's entire ride to the station and hear real-time audio from space to ground on our mission audio stream on YouTube. Just look for the link on NASA social media accounts and in the description of the NASA YouTube launch broadcast. And though our coverage here at Kennedy Space Center is concluding, Crew-6's mission has only just begun. And you know it well, Raja, when you go up into the International Space Station, you really enjoyed the ride getting there because that's when the work starts. Exactly, yeah. So it's actually a really nice period of time here. You got some time to look out the window, uh, enjoy your time. You spend a lot of time in the sim, the Dragon sim, whether it's out at Hawthorne or the, the ones out in Houston. Um, but it's nice to actually you know, now enjoy the ride uh, and take it all in, especially for the, the three rookies. Get used to some space adaptation, moving around in, in microgravity before you get on the space station. Because as soon as you show up in the space station, man, it is busy. <laughs> it is fun, but it is busy. Time to get to work. Next up is our post-launch news conference scheduled for 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time on NASA TV. We'll have a live joint docking coverage. Uh, of Crew 6. We'll have the welcome ceremony starting at 11 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. Uh, this is, is this will be on Thursday on NASA TV as well as SpaceX's YouTube channel. And you can find mission updates on Twitter, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at nasa.gov, including that link. We'll have it in there in the description. 
of the Mission Audio Stream if you want to stick with Crew 6 during their entire journey to the space station. Well, before we want to sign off here at Kennedy, I want to thank Raja Chari for being on the launch broadcast and sharing your incredible experiences. I learned such an incredible amount. I hope our audience did too. You answered all their questions and it was fascinating <laughs> just to listen to all the things that happened. Really appreciate well, you being here. Thanks, I'm, I'm glad I got a chance to see a, a rocket launch. And so, yeah, I highly recommend coming here to do this so you can get a great view of a rocket launch. It's the way to go. Great plug for the Kennedy Space Center there, Roger. We appreciate that and good luck to you on your work with the HLS, you're doing uh, a lot of work there with the human landing system for the Artemis program, and people are really excited about that. Yeah, they should be. It's, it is an amazing time. We've, we're seeing what we're doing in low Earth orbit, and that is just the first step, man. We are going back to the moon to stay and onto Mars, and it is a great time to be in space. Congratulations on watching your first launch, and congratulations to the space lovebirds out there <laughs> at the Kennedy Space Center who tied, or well, at least had, had the proposal and got a big yes. And then, of course, thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. We really appreciate you watching. You, is, you are why we do this, right? So here now are some highlights from the journey to orbit off the Earth for the Earth. For Rajachari and everyone here at the NASA Kennedy Space Center, I'm Daryl Nail. Have a great night and keep looking up. Crew 6 on the move inside astronaut crew quarters. Crew 6, walking outside of astronaut crew quarters for the second time. Andre Fedeyev, Woody Hoberg, Stephen Bowen, and Sultan al -Niyani. With The crew departing the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, a full security escort across NASA's Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. The commander and pilot, Stephen and Woody, making their way inside Dragon. There go our two mission specialists as they cross the hatch, being very careful. It's a five-point harness just to save wear and tear on the suits. A lot of times the ground crew will, will help with doing that. As we watch the SpaceX closeout crew close the hatch to the Dragon capsule. Three, two, one. It is full power and lift off of crew six. Go Dragon, go Falcon.